And we are all set to begin, Chair Ocho, when you are ready. Uh, thank you very much, Jennifer. All right, it is 9 a.m. and we will go ahead and get started uh, with the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Civil Oversight Commission January meeting, our first of the year. Happy New Year to everyone. I uh, hope you had a safe and healthy holiday season. Um, uh, we come to you all, uh, many of us, uh, all of us from Los Angeles County, uh, which the Civil Oversight Commission acknowledges is the uh, traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. It's important that we make these acknowledgments uh, because of the histories of dispossession, because of the histories of uh, colonialism that uh, often erases uh, the traditional role uh, that uh, the Tongva peoples have played in, in the places that we live, work, uh, and, and raise our families. And so it's important that we acknowledge um, the land on which we stand and, and how we came to be here. Um, uh, so I'm not going to say too much more. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and get our meeting started. So with that, um, Ingrid, if you could please call the roll. Absolutely. Chair Bonner of Commissioner Bonner. Commissioner Gigan. Here. Commissioner Harris. Here. Commissioner Kennedy. Here. Commissioner Rubin. Yes, here. Chair Ochen. Here. And Commissioner uh I think that is it. We are we are a lean today. Uh, we are we are about five uh, today. We have a number of um, vacancies that we hope uh, will be filled uh, in the coming weeks, and I'm sure uh, Mr. Williams will talk a bit about that during his report. Uh, so we'll we'll go over uh, briefly a few administrative items um, uh, um, with regard to our agenda. And before we get to our uh, uh, public comments, I'll, I'll tell people how you can access us uh, to speak on our agenda. Uh, today, we are going to we have a, a, a robust uh, uh, agenda uh, that includes a number of critical issues related to conditions of confinement in LA jails, mental health crisis response alternatives, and a number of updates on our prior actions. Um, as we get the meeting started, I wanna go over a couple of ground rules, uh, in particular, our code of conduct, um, uh, which is in our bylaws. So uh, in order to ensure a productive meeting for everyone, um, I wanna sort of highlight them here. One is that speakers must uh, stop speaking when their time has ended, and I'll announce how much time you have. Hopefully, we'll be able to give the full uh, complement of time for public comment. Public comment must relate to the agenda item subject uh, and must be limited to the commission's jurisdiction. Um, uh, although public comment is a right, uh, it is not. It does not include the right to engage uh, in a dialogue with members of the commission, the office of the inspector general, or the commission staff. Um, we want to make sure that this is a respectful place. So uh, please make sure that you refrain from profane, personal, threatening, derogatory, demeaning or abusive statements. Um, please be respectful of the views expressed by the speakers, staff, and commission members, and do not disrupt uh, the orderly conduct of the meeting. <clears throat> and if you do uh, violate any of the aforementioned uh, code of conduct, uh, the staff will uh, terminate uh, your call so that you can no longer continue um, your public comment. Okay, so that's our code of conduct. Uh, when we get to public comment, I'll, I'll give folks uh, um, uh, a heads up on how you can join us uh, when we get to those items on the agenda. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we will begin with our consent calendar, uh, which uh, includes a number of different uh, largely administrative um, items. Uh, it includes our November uh, 18th, 2021 minutes or December 9th uh, minutes uh, from the town hall we hosted on deputy gangs, as well as uh, the approval of our 2022 commission meeting schedule. 
and uh, minor updates to our uh, commission bylaws. Uh, if there is no objection, uh, these items will uh, be deemed to be adopted. Uh, is there any objection to adopting uh, our minutes from November 8th, December 9th of 2021, our 2022 commission uh, meeting schedule, and minor revisions to our bylaws? Is there any objection? Okay, hearing none, uh, those items are adopted. Okay, we'll move into item two on our agenda, which are our reports, uh, starting with the chair's report. Uh, so we have been very busy uh, over the course of the last few weeks, uh, following up on uh, a motion that was passed by the commission directing the chair <clears throat> and the vice chair, Sean Kennedy, uh, to engage uh, special counsel to aid the commission in our deputy gang investigation. I'm happy to report that we have identified a pro bono counsel who will be announced uh, once we uh, sign an engagement letter with them and their firm. Uh, we are currently working out the details, but we have an agreement in principle with county counsel uh, and the civilian oversight commission. Uh, county counsel will uh, authorize uh, our engagement with special counsel and special counsel will work for the benefit of the commission and our inquiry into deputy gangs. Um, uh, you should expect in the coming weeks uh, an announcement of a, a schedule in terms of hearings um, once we are able to onboard our special counsel and our broader legal team. Uh, so I want to thank uh, members of county council for um, uh, working with us on this uh, matter uh, to resolve um, any uh, problems, ambiguities, or, or disputes. Uh, I want to thank uh, the supervisors for, for their support, uh, particularly uh, Supervisor Kuehl and, supervi and uh, Chair uh, Supervisor uh, Mitchell uh, for uh, intervening and helping us to um, uh, facilitate a, a broader conversation with County Council around a few sticking points. Uh, I want to thank the Justice Deputies for their, their time and attention to this matter, and I, I hope that it, it's a model for us going forward. Uh, so we'll, we'll look forward to announcing the details regarding our special counsel. Uh, I also have a bit of um, personal news, uh, which is that I will be stepping down as chair of the commission and from the commission as a, as a, and from the commission generally uh, due to a new position that I'll be taking that precludes my um, membership on the commission, which is, um, you know, something that I, a, a place that I have uh, been engaged with for the last six years. And I hope that I've done some good work on behalf of uh, folks in LA County, particularly in communities that are deeply affected by policing and police violence. Uh, I have tried to uh, do my very best to represent uh, communities that are often ignored in these conversations, and I hope to continue to do so uh, in my future endeavors. Uh, so I just want to thank uh, all of the commissioners for uh, your friendship, camaraderie, for your collegiality. I want to thank the staff. Uh, for all of their hard work um, in stepping up and, and, and really carrying a significant uh, amount of workload um, that we are fighting to get you additional resources. And I hope that that will come to fruition as well. And I want to thank everyone, uh, all of the people who come month after month uh, to continue to advocate, to continue to push the commission to do our work, which is to uh, ensure uh, transparency and accountability, no matter who uh, is uh, the sheriff. Um, and not to back down from asking critical questions on behalf of the residents of LA County. It's been an honor to serve on this commission, uh, and I look forward to see what the commission does in the future. Uh, so thank you. That is my report. I'll turn it over to Commissioner Williams. Excuse me, to, not to Commissioner Williams, Executive Director Williams. I appreciate it. Thank you, Chair Ochin. Uh, certainly, I could not make any comments without first thanking uh, Priscilla for her tremendous work. Priscilla was one of our original members of the commission. She's been on for five years and uh, 43 days. So your work, your intellect, your leadership have all been appreciated by both the staff and the commission members of the community and we wish you the absolute best. Uh, this isn't goodbye for us because we suspect that we'll be contacting you to assist us in our endeavors and to continue with our community. Thank you, Brian. Service on the commission. I uh, also want to thank uh, Pastor Thompson, whom you all know is not here today. 
he was definitely a big part of our community outreach and but for him many of our community meetings would not have happened because he was able to secure locations and participants for us so in his absence we want to thank him for his service he too is also one of the original members of the so thank you pastor thompson if you are listening to what we had to say just a couple other uh brief announcements i want to just briefly talk about commissioner recruitment as uh, chair ochin uh, pointed out we are down a number of commissioners, uh, two who are appointed by the board, directly by the board, and now there will be two community appointees. Of course, Commissioner Tolentino who resigned for health reasons uh, at our last meeting. We continue to thank him and, and pray for his, uh, his uh, better health. We are in the active recruitment stage for two community commissioners. Uh, we mentioned this at our last meeting. We've done multiple email blasts. It's on our webpage. These are supposed to and should uh, represent segments of the community. And the process is this, as you can see on the screen right now, you can go to our website at coc.lacounty.gov and uh, click on that portion that says apply to become a commissioner. Uh, hope to have uh, uh, many applications by February 1st, but I really want to encourage, especially members of the community and organizations to apply for this position We'll go through an interview process and, and the names whom we choose report to the Board of Supervisors for approval. We'd like to move on this fairly quickly, if at all possible, to get folks on board by our February or March meeting. Um, but to do that, you're going to have to apply. So I really encourage you to apply. Feel free to give us a call if you have any questions about that. If you have some friends or colleagues or members of your household who you think might be a good commissioner, we would ask that you pass this information on to them. It does require a commitment of time, a commitment of energy, and a passion for the community to uh, serve on this commission. So with that, that concludes my report. And again, congratulations to you, Priscilla. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Okay, uh, next we will hear from the, uh, from Max Huntsman, uh, Office of the Inspector General. I will repeat what Brian said. Uh, thank you, Chair Priscilla, for all your work. And um, <clears throat> we're going to miss you as along with uh, other commissioners who have left us because uh, it's a hard uh, job to spill. Uh, Phil, as, as Brian said, I, I hope folks out there who are watching and, and listening uh, will step up and, and participate with us because it's really an important role that requires a balance of diplomacy and, and enthusiastic activism that is uh, is a, a difficult thing, I, I know, from personal experience in, in government. And I just want to really thank uh, the chair, as well as the other uh, retiring, if you will, uh, commissioners who have, have uh, worked at that for so long and I think done such an excellent job. So thank you, Priscilla, in particular. Um, I don't have much to report. The, the, as we all know, there's been a change in law. As of January 1st, the uh, law enforcement gang has an official legal definition, which includes a violation of uh, federal employment rules. So as a result, it's highly likely from the information that the Sheriff's Department has already gathered uh, that the banditos and the executioners and possibly other groups are law enforcement gangs under the definition. And so the inspector general's office, along with the attorney general's office are charged with investigating that and post will now be charged with pulling the ticket of any uh, peace officer who participates in, in a deputy uh, gang and also those who uh, fail to cooperate in the investigations, including specifically enumerated inspector general investigations. So I look forward to what was announced today. Uh, about the commission bringing in outside counsel to help uh, strengthen an effort to run a, a series of hearings and as a CCJV kind of like process on this. And hopefully we we'll actually be able to eradicate uh, the deputy gangs permanently from the sheriff's department. To that end, we just sent a letter to the sheriff um, asking him to consult with the unions and to work on trying to have a framework, a working framework in place before we begin this process. It would be just horrible if the sheriff was giving orders like the ones he's given in the past to his staff not to cooperate in oversight laws when that now will result potentially in them having post uh, take away their, their um, right to be a peace officer. So they'll be forced between having to obey an order from their boss versus having to follow the law in a way that they always have, but now we'll have a much more direct 
uh, impact upon their, their career. So I'm hoping that that can be resolved quickly. And as we go forward and conduct interviews, um, deputies can be uh, candid about what's going on and we can resolve which groups are, are not acceptable and, and need to be removed. And we can most importantly take away the secrecy of them, which I think is their most corrupting uh, aspect in the sheriff's department over the years. So that's an important uh, event that's about to happen. Um, and, and those are the steps we've taken so far, as you know, also a big component of that is litigation. So we've uh, begun a process of litigating as the commission is engaged closely with county council on its planned work. It's also engaged closely on the litigation. As you know, we've already got a contempt proceeding against the sheriff for failing to appear at the commission meetings. Likewise, we have waiting in the hopper a series of county council actions against the sheriff and the sheriff's department regarding failure to comply with the subpoenas and also failure to comply with oversight laws that require them to give access to their records, um, specifically disciplinary records in their computer system and body camera video, which under the government code, they don't have a choice about whether or not to show, show to us. So that litigation is also pending, but hasn't been filed yet. So we expect that to happen soon. Uh, County Council assures us that should be a week or so away. Um, that was a week or so ago, and so I think it's imminent, but everything always gets pushed back a, a few days. So I think we can expect that hopefully before our next um, meeting. And then of course the process is long and slow. So that's kind of the most important things that are happening now. And uh, and I would leave it at that absent uh, other issues that come up during the meeting. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Huntsman for the kind words and for your report. Uh, next, we will hear from uh, commissioners with any reports that they have uh, on behalf of themselves or on behalf of their ad hoc committee. Are there any uh, reports or comments? All right, seeing none, we will move on to the next item on our agenda, uh, which is a report from the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. Is anyone from the Sheriff's Department here and prepared to make a report? Okay, uh, does not. Good morning, Commissioner. It's Brendan Corbett. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. I'm here. well. I'm prepared to report on the COVID and the jails update specifically, not as an overview for the department. If that's your question, that's perfectly fine. Thank you so much for letting me know, uh, Assistant Chair Corbett. Okay, uh, so so we'll move on uh, and hear from County Council. Uh, Alex, are you here? I am here, Chair. I, I understand the commission uh, would like an update regarding the request of the Attorney General Office to take over the Sheriff's Department investigation of oversight officials. So, yes. County Council has submitted this request to the Attorney General's Office. It is our understanding that they are considering the request. So that is the um, the only information we have at this time. Is there any other specific items that the chair of the commission would like an update on? Uh, first, thank you so much for submitting the request on behalf of the commission. Um, Mr. Williams, if it's possible, I think it would be great if for us to post uh, the letter that was sent uh, by county council to the uh, state attorney uh, general uh, so that the public can have access to it and get a sense of what the request was, uh, the scope of it, um, and the remedies that we're seeking from the state attorney general. Um, Alex, I'm wondering if you could also talk about the sort of uh, second item that we requested from the county council, uh, which was a report to the commission about whether any of the sheriff's department's activities in investigating um, oversight officials uh, is in violation of the uh, county of any county ordinances or any provisions of the county charter. Uh, can you provide us with the status of that? As you recall, we asked for that report within 30 days. Obviously, it's been much longer than that. And I'm wondering if you could tell us a bit about the process and what we should expect. Yes, Chair, we are in the process of conducting that analysis and we expect to have a further update soon. Okay, um, and I hope that it's sooner rather than uh, later, uh, given um, the importance of, of your analysis and, and this issue. Are there any questions for County Council from the Commission? Okay, uh, then we will move on. Uh, so, lastly, uh, we are going to have uh, an election for the position of uh, chair uh, of the Commission. We are not going to have um, 
uh, election for vice chair. We did that last uh, at our last meeting in November. Uh, we elected Sean Kennedy as our vice chair. Uh, so we're going to have an election for chair, and that chair will take over. Will be chair elect for this meeting, and will take over uh, as chair in the month of February. Uh, so at this point, uh, we will open. Uh, now, yes. Uh, yes. If I may, uh, by operation of our bylaws, we uh, checked this this morning. The vice chair automatically becomes the chair of the commission. Once the chair leaves the position, so then really the only election we would need to have at this point, unless the commission wish, wishes otherwise, is for the position of vice chair. Okay, uh, so let me uh, let's let's put a pin in this because I think I'd like to consult with my colleague, uh, Mr. Kennedy, to see if he wishes to ascend uh, to the role of chair. Uh, then we can figure out whether we need to have a chair election. Can we, if with the commission's indulgence, we'll. Uh, put this off until after our 15 minute break. Does that sound okay? All right, thank you so much. Okay, so uh, we'll um, table the election of the chair position uh, and then we will uh, come back to it uh, later on in the agenda. So we will uh, move on then uh, to uh, item number three, which is uh, discussion and possible action. Uh, the first item is our family impact remarks. Um, uh, Jennifer uh, is uh, our speaker uh, here. Yes. Yes. Uh, so we have family impact remarks from the family of uh, Jelani uh, Lovett. Um, uh, Jennifer, please invite the family of uh, Jelani Lovett to give their remarks. Sure. Terry, you are unmuted if you would like to begin. Uh, Chair Ochen, how much time are we allotting? We are allotting uh, 10 minutes. Okay. Tara, uh, you are unmuted. Yes, good morning. Um, yes, I'm very disappointed in the response, the time of the response that I've been receiving from the sheriff's department. I haven't spoke with anybody from the sheriff or from the coroner's office since November. And the coroner gave the autopsy report to a reporter which I believe is un illegal. I'm checking into it to see because if it is, I'm going to file a report. I mean, a, a complaint against the coroner's office. It's my understanding that the coroner can give out the coroner's report, but not the autopsy report. Okay, I am very disappointed in uh, the oversight commission. I contacted them to file a complaint against the sheriff. Uh, November the 8th, it was my understanding they had to December the 8th to return to answer the complaint. I have not heard. Well, I talked to the uh, lady at the Oversight Commission last week. She said the investigation is still ongoing. And I have I have nothing about my son. This, re this report from the coroner saying that he died from fit a fentanyl and heroin OD. Well, he's been in jail for two years. So then how did he get fentanyl and heroin into the jail? Okay, so it leads me to think that either the deputies put it in there, put it, put it in him, or either put it in there because he didn't have, he was in a one man cell, solitary confinement. He didn't have access at general population. How did fear heroin and fentanyl get into the jail? So I'm very disappointed. I'm very upset. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure if there are any mothers on the panel, they would be upset as well because the chair have an obligation to protect and serve not only people on the streets but inmates as well you know i have I, I, is a, there's been no transparency in jelani's case to the family you know i'm just very upset with how la is how la runs is 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 jail system and communicating with with families it took them that I, i'm getting from the coroner's report that my son died at seven, at seven that evening of the 22nd. I didn't hear from the sheriff's department until 10.30 the next morning. What took so long for them to contact the next kid? You know, it tends to make me think that something was done to him that shouldn't have been being done, or something was being covered up, something was being hid. The coroner said he doesn't see any foul play. The homicide detective said he didn't see, see any foul play. My son has literally been beat to death and I have the coroner's pictures to prove it, how the coroner received the body from the sheriff. So I'm just very disgusted, very disappointed in LA law enforcement. Uh, the, the 
uh, Inspector General's office. You know, um, I don't know if you're the person that I'm making complaints to, but because I've contacted the Inspector General, I've tried to follow the chain of command. So I guess next I need to go to the the grand jury in L.A. Because I'm not getting any answers or any help. I have all doors are being closed in my face. So I, I really don't have anything really to, that I want to say to this to this board, this county board. I don't have anything really I want to say, but I did want to say that to let y'all know I'm very disappointed. I'm very angry, and I'm very hurt. My son would have been 28 years old last week, and he's dead. And he did not use drugs. He did not use drugs. So drugs, if drugs was in him, the sheriff put him in him. Now, I don't know anything about this 3,000 gang that y'all have down there within the sheriff's department, no more than what I've been reading online. But I know my son died on the 3,000th floor. So I don't have anything else I want to say to the Board of Supervisors. Miss Lovett, Miss Lovett, um, I just want to say this is uh, Priscilla Chen. Uh, on behalf of the commission, um, we want to extend our deepest condolences to you and your family um, on the death of your your son. Uh, Twenty eight years old is is it's, it's a tragedy under any circumstances, and 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 we are deeply sorry uh, for your loss. Um, we want to try to have our staff follow up with you. Uh, so, Mr. Williams, if you can coordinate with Ms. Lovett um, uh, to have our staff follow up uh, uh, regarding some of the issues that she is experiencing, trying to access information, I can only imagine how how enraging uh, I would be uh, in your position, and, and we understand how frustrated and angry you are uh, because you haven't gotten answers to your questions. Um, and this is something that we have uh, confronted with other family members. Uh, holds uh, on autopsies um, and underlying information regarding deaths uh, without a clear explanation. And that's something that the commission is pushing to get some clarity on and some policy changes um, uh, made with regard to how autopsies are handled when there is a death in custody or someone is killed by a member of the sheriff's department. Um, we also are working on trying to shore up and expand uh, or, or adequately staff and resource uh, something that the commission has pushed for, Ms. Levitt, which is the family assistance program. Um, and in that program, uh, as we imagined it, and as the Board of Supervisors uh, passed a motion, is designed to support families like yours um, after the tragic death of a loved one, uh, to ensure that you have adequate support, that someone is uh, a liaison between you and the county ensuring that you get information and the resources uh, that you need to to hold uh, what what obviously is a very traumatic uh, event in in your life and in the life of, of your family and broader community um, so i'm hoping that our staff can also work with you to connect you to some resources uh, to advocate on your behalf to get information released and get some some inf and to get some of your questions answered um, so, uh, Jennifer, I believe you have, uh, and, and other members of our staff, like Frederick, has, have been in contact with Miss um, uh, Love it, uh, and so I hope that we can we can facilitate those connections. Thank you so much for for your comments, Miss Miss Love it. Uh, we will take um, public comment on the family impact remarks along with uh, general uh, public comment at the end, uh, toward the end of the meeting. Um, okay. Uh, okay, so did you, did you want to say anything else? No, I just don't know, but just something needs to be done about LA County here. I mean, just something, I don't know what kind of power y'all have over the, the, inspector, the inspector general. He must don't have no power over him. Something needs to be done. I mean, this has been going, from what I'm reading, this has been going on for years. And I guess everybody just, it's easier to turn your head than to do something about the problem, but it's out of hand. It's it just, is. Even if the things online are not true, then they should be quit being put online. But I would think that it's true, all the stuff that I'm reading online about the 3,000 boys and all these gangs and the sheriff. And it sheriff, that's law enforcement I'd be to protect the service should not be in no gang members. You know, they should not be gang members. And then and, and, and the, the, the head sheriff said they can do what they want to do when they ain't on duty. That should not be. 
I don't, I don't, I don't know much about politics, but I just know certain things that are just not ethical. And, and thank you all for your time today. And I, no, I don't have anything else I want to say. Thank you for even allowing me to express my thoughts and feelings about how I'm feeling now. Thank you. Um, and and just, just so you know, we agree with you. Uh, this has been going on, deputy gangs, the allegations of deputy gangs, whether they are true or not, uh, we, we believe they are true. Um, the fact that a family member has to question right, whether their loved one was impacted by uh, deputy gang activity uh, is appalling. Right? There should never be such a question in anyone's mind with regard to a taxpayer-funded law enforcement agency. And so we are committed to getting to the bottom of this. And, and as I said at the top of the meeting, Ms. Lovett, we are, uh, are uh, commissioning a team of lawyers uh, to help us with our investigation. And, and we hope to produce a comprehensive report and set of recommendations, along with the policy that we have already recommended to outright ban uh, deputy gangs uh, in alignment with state law. Um, and, and we hope that the sheriff will uh, adopt it instead of um, blocking uh, its, its, its adoption and implementation. Okay, um, so again, thank you so much, Ms. Lovett, for, for your remarks and for, for sharing with us uh, today. Um, uh, we are going to now take up a number of important items, I think, uh, that, that Ms. Lovett raised with regard to the conditions of uh, LA County Jail, the conditions of confinement in LA County Jail. Uh, so we have a number of items that we will take uh, one at a time. So after each um, uh, matter, we will hear from the commission uh, and then uh, we will uh, hear from uh, the public once we've uh, gone through each, each of the three items. Okay, so uh, our first item uh, with regard to conditions of confinement at LA County Jails uh, is uh, a report on allegations regarding racially disparate, disparate treatment of people incarcerated at the Century Regional Detention Facility, otherwise known as the Linwood Facility, uh, which is a jail that uh, houses um, uh, women or people who have uh, been identified uh, or identify as, as uh, women. Um, so, uh, we have two guest speakers, uh, uh, Dr. Cheryl Grills, who is a professor at uh, Loyola Marymount University and the vice chairperson of the Los Angeles County Civil Grand uh, Commission. Uh, uh, Dr. Grills uh, routinely goes into uh, custody environments in LA County jails um, as part of her work on the Civil Grand Commission to do audits, uh, which is where uh, we heard some of the initial reports regarding um, racial discrimination against black women at the Linwood uh, facility. We will also hear from uh, Susan Burton, who is the founder and executive director of A New Way of Life uh, and a, uh, a staunch advocate for uh, incarcerated and formerly incarcerated uh, women. So first we will hear from, and I should also note that uh, Ms. Burton was also a member of the Civil Grant Commission and has experience um, monitoring and auditing uh, jail facilities like uh, Linwood. So um, if Dr. Grills is here, is Dr. Grills here? She is not on yet. She's scheduled to be on at 9.45. We're reaching out to see if she can get on earlier. Okay. Um, Ms. Burton is here. So, um, Ms. Burton, why don't we start with uh, you? Can you tell us a little bit about uh, your work and your relationship with the LA County uh, jails, particularly Linwood, and your observations regarding the treatment of uh, Black women? Thank you so much for being here. Sure, Chair Ocean. Uh, I'm sure we're going to miss you a lot on this on this uh, oversight commission. Um, and um, I think you've done a great job, so thank you. So I wanna thank all of the commissioners on the Oversight Commission uh, for their work. Um, I know it's a heavy, heavy job to try to bring some um, compliance into the Sheriff's Department. As I was a commissioner, a civil brand commissioner for eight years, and it was one of the most um, difficult tasks that I had uh, to walk in and every every week or every other week and see the conduct and the sheriffs uh, operating in so many ways that seem contrary to justice, uh, contrary to treating people with um, with uh, um, some some form of dignity. 
So what I wanted to report on this morning is that a, a new way of life entered into an agreement to provide uh, workforce development, um, uh, pre-release classes to uh, women being held in CRDF, a Century Regional Detention Center. And what we've seen is um, just uh, um, what I would so call discrimination in the enrollment of Black women. So we have in, we have uh, provided uh, uh, um, employment readiness services to 79 women. Of those 79 women, 11 were Black. Uh, of those 11, only nine were able to complete the class because two were pulled out to go to work in one of the uh, kitchen dorms. Um, so that leaves it, uh, you know, to about 10% when the census for Black women there are uh, between 30 and 33%. I have repeatedly talked to the sheriffs about the uh, disproportionate uh, participation of Black women uh, uh, in that class and asked for some type of equity and I have not gotten anywhere with them. Uh, it seems, you know, uh, from my view, the sheriffs do what the sheriffs want to do. And it's really, really difficult to uh, bring them into any type of um, uh, equity lens around these classes. Uh, you know, the women um, that participate in this class has a really great advantage that uh, they only not only get uh, pre-release uh, um, employment classes, upon release, they get placed in a job. Upon release, they get housing. Upon release, they get uh, 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 financial resources to access clothing. Upon release, they get this whole host of resources that will uh, allow them success upon release. And um, the fact that we can get any equity around who is, has access to this class is quite disturbing for me. Um, as a um, staunch advocate and running, you know, a black led organization, also with me being formerly incarcerated, you know, I remember how difficult it was for myself, you know, 30, 40 years ago to be able to access a class that would give me some level of opportunity of, of success upon release. So uh, I don't know uh, if you have any questions. Um, you know, the, um, you know, the contract was between the sheriffs, a workforce development and center for uh, employment opportunities. And, you know, it was a great, uh, I think, uh, um, uh, 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 joint uh, type of approach to help people not recidivate, uh, but black women, you know, are not getting the opportunity. So it's like 10% of uh, the class is is black when the census is around 30 to 33 percent black in the jail. So so we'll hear a bit more from uh, Cheryl Grills about this. Uh, so uh, just I just want to make the commission mindful that we'll get some additional detail. But at this point, um, since she's not yet here, we'll take some questions for Ms. Burton. Commissioner Rubin. Yes, thank you so much, Ms. Burton. Um, your organization does incredible work, and I want to thank you for your leadership in that regard. Um, I wanted to ask you more specifically, um, you said you raised some concerns with the sheriff um, about the disproportionate numbers and that um, you didn't get any kind of response or any satisfactory kind of response. Um, and you made some, you know, you did say, well, the sheriff does what the sheriff wants to do. And we've all experienced that. Um, but specifically, um, at what level did you speak to the sheriff? Um, and, and who at CDRF 
um, and uh, whether it was just once or you really tried to push them to give you some response because the, the numbers are just not acceptable. So if you could um, give us a little bit of information in that regard, it would be helpful uh, for us to know who we need to go to to press this issue. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, I don't remember the woman's last name, but I remember her first name being Melissa. Uh, we have had, we have weekly meetings and I attended uh, one of the meetings with the Sheriff's Department for the liaison who actually creates the list uh, that, um, that, that, um, that, that, we select or, or we go in and recruit from a list that the sheriffs give us. Um, and what I want to say is that um, almost 80, 90 percent of that list is non black women uh, that they give us to recruit from. Um, I've also went to our county board of supervisors uh, and the county board of supervisors have had some hearings on this. So my supervisor is Holly Mitchell uh, and I've taken it, uh, the information to her several times and I believe that she's had hearings on it. Uh, but still, even after bringing uh, it to the attention from the Board of Supervisors, the, the number of participation of Black women are, 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 are low. A matter of fact, this particular cohort that we're about to um, uh, uh, do the workforce, the um, uh, 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 pre-release employment services with, has no black women, you know, right now. So, um, you know, I pressed and I pressed um, to the point that it feels like, um, you know, I'm barking at the moon, so to speak. I haven't gotten any response. Uh, that doesn't mean that I, you know, give up, but I mean, I pressed and pushed every button that I know of and I, and I think I, I call myself pretty well connected, but, uh, the sheriffs does what the sheriffs want to do. Um, and even as a commissioner of the civil brag commission, going into those jails and seeing the condition of the jail and the way that they treat people held in sheriff's custody is deplorable. It's, um, it's, it's like traumatic every time and very troublesome. So I know it's a really heavy lift to, you know, correct all that's went wrong for so long. But as part of the commission, as part of uh, a Max's shop, uh, as part of the Board of Supervisors, you know, we must continue to um, uh, reach for that, 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 you know, uh, decency and dignity and safety. You know, I just heard the woman talk about her son, which was awful, but yeah. So I don't, you know, I have, I have pressed, I have went to the Board of Supervisors, you know, I've talked to Ms. Ocean about it. Uh, I went to the sheriffs directly. I've talked to our um, our liaisons with Workforce Development, uh, Center for Employment Opportunities, uh, and it's getting, I think, to the place that um, even the the other women, the Latina and white women, are are complaining about the level of discrimination they see. Uh, Miss Miss Burton, I have a. a, a quick question, then I'll take Commissioner Giggins. Um, from the, the women whom you've uh, had a chance to talk with, what are some of the impediments that they've identified for, for Black women's participation? So, I mean, in other words, what kind of discrimination tends to so, exclude Black women? Yeah, so they talk about there being a, um, a, um, a, a sort of um, a classification like tool that uh, they use in the recruitment of uh, people that go on the list that we go in and recruit. And that uh, because of that classification tool, uh, because, you know, the women who are black women are not, you know, uh, on that list because of that classification tool. But 
Um, so they have some, you know, uh, loose justifications. I don't, I don't, I don't see them being real valid. But yeah. Have, have you, uh, so one of the things I think we should do is to get a copy of that tool um, uh, for us to review it. Um, you know, if you look at the social science on risk assessment tools and other kind of classification tools, um, you will find that they are rife with inherent racial biases um, that disadvantage disproportionately black folks. Um, and so it uh, sounds like from what you're saying, that may be a contributing factor here, along with some of the other things that hopefully uh, Commissioner Grills um, will talk a bit about. Um, so we hope to hear a bit more from, from her about that. Uh, Commissioner Giggins. Um, thank you, Priscilla. And thank you so much for being here, Susan. Um, and I hope you'll come back. Your work has been so uh, significant and consequential for many years now. And uh, I'm surprised we haven't had you visit us before. But um, my, my, I guess I'm looking for a little bit of a flavor and I hear you describe uh, barking at the moon uh, and trying different efforts. So if you might, how would you describe your, say more recent response from the powers that be at the Sheriff's Department? Do you feel you're being ignored do you on the, the issue and 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 your um inquiries do you feel that you're being shunned do you feel that you're being dismissed do you feel that you're being boycotted i, I just looking for a little bit of a flavor of if you if you keep barking you know is anybody barking back or they just don't so want to I feel, yeah i feel yeah, yeah i feel as though uh i'm being managed and my complaints that I, I, um, uh, um, uh, uh, the complaints that I voice, uh, they're being managed, uh, to, uh, uh, to continue to justify or dismiss what I'm saying. You know, I mean, they give me the, the, um, excuses or the justifications with a, um, not quite a smile, but with a, you know, this is what's happening here and we're trying our best, but, but that's not true. And I can see, see through that. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, I just feel like I'm being managed in the meeting and in the discussion. We, we understand. Yeah. We know how you feel, except that we don't even get a smile. So, so sorry. I, I don't mean to, uh, uh, excluding, uh, assisted chair Corbett. He's wonderful. Um, uh, so uh, are there any other questions? All right. So, um, I'm hoping that we, we, do we have a ETA for Dr. Grills? So far, we do not have a response yet. Okay. Um, so, uh, are there, are there any other questions for. Um, Miss uh, Burton. Well, I, uh, sorry, I go a, ahead. Oh, okay. Sorry. I have another one, if I might. Thank you. Um, since she's here and we have a couple of minutes uh, for the next speaker. Um, Susan, I'm sure that you are hearing about different alternatives and all different uh, in terms of response, particularly with people with um, you know, having mental issues or breakdowns or in terms of any kind of, uh, you know, there's a lot going on. I just wondered um, uh, if you share with us, are you, are you um, hearing more about these different options uh, that's out there from your vantage point to improve, yeah. to improve response all, you know, in every way? Well, I'm hearing from the Office of Diversion and Reentry that they are uh, creating some programs around you know, mental health diversion, uh, and then the alternatives to incarceration work group are working on, you know, implementing some alternatives to incarceration, but I haven't really heard um, uh, uh, about ATI actually getting really going with their, um, with their programs, but I, I haven't followed them to the to the to really really close so uh you know i'm in a wheelchair right now i broke my leg uh 
Oh no. Uh, so I'm not out and and uh, uh, running amok as much as I used to. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, but uh, I know the Office of Diversion and Reentry is uh, working on um, some alternative uh, to incarceration sites and diversion sites. So I see Dr. Grills is with us now. Hey, yes. Cheryl. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Grills. Uh, so, um, Ms. Burton, I'm wondering if you can, you can hang out with us a little bit uh, through Dr. Grills' presentation, and then if there are additional questions, we can ask you both. Uh, is that okay? Sure. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Grills, thank you for joining us. Um, I've introduced you, and so uh, if you're ready, um, I'll turn over uh, the conversation to you. We are discussing uh, racial discrimination against uh, uh, allegations of racial discrimination uh, at CDRF. Um, uh, so I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Grills, if, if you caught your breath at this time. I think you're, you're muted, Dr. Grills. Okay, there it is. Can you hear me now? <clears throat> All right, wonderful. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for inviting me to share uh, some information based on our inspections at CRDF in particular. Um, it came to our attention, um, actually, we've been kind of tracking this for a long time now in the commission, concerns about access uh, initially to education-based incarceration programming and that there were some disparities um, um, it, or disproportionate access, I should say, to the um, EBI programming with women of color and particular black women not seeming to be enrolled in programs at the same rate as other races. But it actually began to expand even beyond that particular issue. Uh, and what we are now doing is uh, a more deep, a, a deeper dive into what we see as um, racially disparate treatment of black women um, by not other women in custody, but by primarily Latinx um, LA, LA Sheriff's Department deputies and custody personnel. This was noted um, by several black women in custody at CRDF um, related to EBI or education programming access, uh, being able to be selected to be a trustee uh, programming time um, not being equal to other women, and then perceived favoritism toward Latina women in custody by um, Latinx uh, uh, custody and deputies. So at first we were getting this information from the Black women. Of course, we tried to find out if um, others were seeing the same thing, and we did get corroboration from um, some of the white women and Latina women in custody that, they're, that they noticed differences in how black women were treated relative to other women in custody. The response from CRDF and LA Sheriff's Department has been woefully inadequate. We have brought this to the attention formally of um, Commander Macias and Captain Montoya um, met with them, Captain Montoya, several times, and for the last four months, all the all that we get back from them when we ask for updates and findings uh, is that they're still investigating. And when we met with them yesterday in our monthly business meeting, uh, we shared with them that four months is um, far too long a period of time to be doing an investigation. Um, we've given them the names of specific deputies that have been shared with us multiple times by multiple women um, as some of the most um, um, common, prominent offenders of this racism. Um, and to date, Captain Montoya says that um, they're still investigating. And, and, and further, she says that the nature of the concerns against staff uh, related to these racial uh, discrimination charges does not warrant escalating the personnel investigations. I found that particularly troubling on multiple levels, including the fact that I have witnessed the women becoming increasingly distressed and they're being traumatized by the response of the Sheriff's Department to their grievances. They have filed grievances 
And in response to filing the grievances, now they are um, give, I, I have so many um, reports back to me from the women of retaliation um, against them from um, the deputies that I have named for um, uh, Captain Montoya um, and still nothing has happened. This, the, the, the level of trauma and the potential racial discrimination charges that could be brought against the county um, seem to be not important or of concern to the Sheriff's Department. Further, we're concerned that about the lack of um, a response for specific women when we cited um, concerns about retaliation and that that retaliation now could extend to other women in custody because sometimes the form of retaliation involves a, a kind of punishment that is not directed just specifically to the black women, but it is extended to the entire module. So a module will go into modified programming or lockdown and that angers all of the women and they blame the black women for that. So where the tensions that the racial tensions were between the black women and custody and deputies, it because of the response of CRDF, it could easily become um, something that's much broader and it didn't need to go um, there. Um, another concern is that uh, each time I go back and check on um, CRDF's response or I ask for a meeting with Captain Montoya, they keep reframing what the issue is. The issue was racial tension between deputies and custody personnel and the black women. The recasting from CRDF in multiple instances, they try to make it tensions between women in custody. That was not the issue. That was not the origins of the problem. Um, and even white, black and Latina women in custody uh, when I would raise this with them, shared with me that they were perplexed by this framing um, of the racial tension issues by, LA, um, by the Sheriff's Department. Um, and then they tried to recast it as this was just an issue for one Black woman in custody. That is not the case. We have reports of racism from a number of women, uh, Black women in custody, and in three modules in particular. It's been hard to fully confirm instances of retaliation because of the way the jail is operating. Um, so we will get information from the women. And then when we go to try to investigate it, the, the Sheriff's Department has already started shape shifting the issues. Um, and there's, there are incredible levels of inconsistencies in their statements um, about um, to explain the concerns or the problems that we identify. Even as recently as yesterday, Commander Macias and Captain Montoya um, were inconsistent in explaining why all of the trustees were fired in module 3700. The trustees felt that this was a, uh, an ongoing part of a uh, form of retaliation. Um, Commander Macias said that they were fired because they were installed as trustees in, in a manner that did not follow appropriate protocol. But Captain Montoya said it was because the racial tension um, um, that existed between the Latina and black trustees and that that response to fire them all was necessary. Um, and in terms of um, an example of, of the retaliation or examples, uh, women will be, the black women will be moved to new modules. Um, they will have their roommates changed on them. They have had their positions um, taken away from them. Uh, they have been um, there the, on the receiving end of agitation uh, and statements such as, um, go ahead, file another grievance. I've had grievances filed on me before and I'm still here. Um, or if you just stop all of these grievances, everything will be all right. Or go ahead, go ahead and call somebody, go call civil brand commission or the OIG, you know, see if I care. Um, and then they, and then another example would be the modified programming that the women in 3700 were placed on in December, actually on December 23rd, they were two days before Christmas, they were put on modified programming. 
where they were only allowed out of their cells for 15 minutes a day. Within those 15 minutes, they had to shower, do commissary, handle any business that they had, and make phone calls. Now, in 15 minutes, how does one do all of that? And that continued into Christmas. So on Christmas day, that just felt cruel to me. On Christmas day, folks were not able to have the kind of contact by phone with their families because of this modified programming. People were also missing court dates. Now, when I tried to get at the bottom of this, I was getting this kind of signaling. One deputy would tell me it's because of this. It's because of a COVID quarantine. Another deputy, it's because a fight broke out between two inmates in a, you know, two inmates in the module and it was racial. A fight did break out. It was between two women in their cell locked. It did not involve the entire module. Why did the entire module get placed on uh, modified programming? And, and then of course the women in the entire module did not have a clear explanation about why they were put on uh, this modified programming. And so the natural assumption is it's because of the racial issues. So now everybody's mad at the black women in the module. The last thing I'll say um, is that um, the women are terrified right now, the black women. And I feel very, cons I feel bad. I'll have to say that they trusted me. They trusted civil brand commission to share what was going on. They found their voice. They, um, and they spoke up and nothing except bad things have happened as a result. And there's been, um, again, as I said, four months um, since we've been raising this and there has been um, no, 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 con no real response except to dismiss, minimize, or try to reframe the issue on the part of the Sheriff's Department. Thank you, Dr. Grills. Uh, are there questions for Dr. Grills? Are there questions for uh, Ms. Burton, uh, Commissioner Rubin? Um, thank you, Dr. Grills. This, this report is just mind boggling um, in terms of the effect on um, the black women and, and what is going on at CDRF. Um, I have a number of questions and I'll try and pick and choose because I know other people will have questions as well. Um, how many deputies um, have you and the commission identified as the ones who um, are creating these problems for the black women um, and ultimately resulting in retaliation and, and all of the other um issues that you've resolved i'm trying to get a handle on what number um are you talking about at least initially whether that has escalated um so if you if you could um help me with that i'd appreciate it yeah there's about six deputies whose names repeatedly come up over and over and over again and we've shared those names with the sheriff's department okay i'm sorry i didn't get the number six six And um, uh, those are the 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 six that um, um, commander um, uh, the the commander that you mentioned, uh, Commander Montoya, has said that this doesn't rise to a le a personnel level. Can you ex expand on that? What's your understanding as to what that response was? So um, what she said is that she, she essentially says she's turned this over to the sergeants or um, other higher level personnel within the jail whose job it is to investigate these kinds of things. Um, and for four months, they've been investigating and nothing has happened, but that they, are, they, don't, they have to do this on top of other responsibilities that they have, and so there's a there's a, a a person power, you know, amount of people to get the work done challenge for them. But ultimately, there's nothing egregious enough in what is being cited as um, um, things that these 
these persons have done that warrants escalating it to make it a priority and to get the investigation done at a faster rate um, or pace. Um, have you identified anything that um, either you or the inspector general or the commission can do to escalate this, to get this um, investigation resolved, moving, um, because having, um, having identified the six deputies and continuing what is going on there is just not acceptable. Exactly. I'm so we uh, civil brand has been in um, greater contact with OIG to see if we can't at least compare notes um, in our in our inspections and um, and share information about CRDF's response. Um, I at this point I'm frustrated and finding that I'm spinning in circles, constantly trying to discern the truth of what's going on uh, each time I do the ins an inspection or each time I have a meeting with someone from the jail because, as I said before, they minimize, you know, uh, deflect attention to something else, reframe things. Um, and for everything that I would raise based on findings from, um, um, meetings with the women, um, they come up with an alternate reality and explanation that is hard to actually investigate. Um, so I'm hoping that OIG will be able to have more teeth. Now, one of the things that I noted yesterday in our business meeting that included um, um, uh, Commander Macias and Captain Montoya um, was that, and uh, Dr. Kelly from the EBI programming side of things, is that they constantly said, we're working with OIG, OIG is investigating. So it was almost like yesterday felt like OIG was being used as the scapegoat or as an excuse to um, essentially shut us up um, to say, you know, don't worry about it, OIG is on it. Um, so I haven't spoken with OIG since then to get an update on where they are at with things. All right, and one final um, question. We do have uh, Assistant Chief Corbett here from the Sheriff's Department, and um, uh, I'm hoping that um, he will be able to weigh in and give us some explanation as to what is not occurring that should be occurring. So I'll let um, others pose questions and Thank you very much for your continued good work. Thank you. Uh, just, just on that point, uh, Commissioner Rubin, uh, my understanding is that the staff did reach out to the Sheriff's Department to ask uh, for a subject matter expert on this matter, perhaps the Captain, uh, um, Captain Montoya that uh, is responsible for uh, CRDF. Uh, the Sheriff declined uh, to send a representative on this subject, although, of course, uh, we do have Assistant Sheriff uh, uh, Corbett, who will talk about COVID-19, as he mentioned, he's not he's not here to talk. He's not the subject matter expert on this issue, um, so we, we're not able to get a, 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 an immediate response. We did, however, uh, the commission sent a letter to the sheriff's department requesting information uh, about grievances, about participation in programs, um, racial uh, breakdowns of uh, discipline. Um, and the bases for why people are being disciplined so that we can get a sense of uh, these kinds of racial disparities. We haven't yet gotten uh, a response to, to my knowledge. Uh, so hopefully we'll have more information. Uh, Mr. Huntsman, uh, did you want to comment at all uh, about uh, this um, and the statements that Mr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Grills made? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I, as uh, Dr. Grill said, we've been working on this but I wouldn't use the term investigation. As you know, from my ordinance and the, from the U.S. Attorney's Manual, there's different definitions for these words, and I use investigation for something with more teeth than the inquiries we conduct. Um, so we are looking into it, and in our quarterly report, we will report on this issue, and as you heard uh, from Susan Burton, uh, there's some strong uh, statistical evidence to support these concerns as to the conduct of individual deputies 
what, what's being described is, is also a CPOE violation. So we'll make sure that the county CPOE process is, is triggered by that. I'm not optimistic that will result in a different amount of investigation, but it might. And as to our investigation, you know, under law, we're permitted to compel statements from deputies, talk to them about specific issues, and actually investigate with our limited staff. But the sheriff's practice has been to order his staff not to cooperate in such investigations, as you know. So we're not able to effectively investigate, really, as to the underlying um, allegations. But we can look into the larger problem of how the department's handling it. And and that's, uh, you know, has always been a concern. I would mention one other thing, which is we're in an unusual situation right now, which is the attorney general is conducting a pattern and practice investigation regarding the sheriff's department, including uh, patterns and practices that violate civil rights inside the jails. So anybody who has information uh, can pass it along to the attorney general's office and it will get, I think, investigated in a way that it ordinarily wouldn't. And, and that's a point uh, we've all made in the past, which is uh, have, asking the sheriff's department to watch themselves is not a good answer to the question, who watches the watchman? And so escalating uh, these sorts of matters, I think, is the only available option for anybody who wants to see a real uh, inquiry. And that's what happened years ago when the CCJV fired up uh, and the FBI got involved in look, looking into allegations of um, violence in the jails. The district attorney's office and the internal processes of the sheriff's department concluded that out of 80 cases alleged by the ACLU, none of them had any substance. Well, the FBI was able to prove that that was decisively wrong and get uh, proof beyond a reasonable doubt in a number of cases. So I think that bringing in outside uh, investigative um, um, authority is a key thing. We at the inspector general's office are now designated with that authority under state law, but we're conducting a legal battle to uh, actually get it implemented. But the attorney general has that that authority already on the books and has an investigation in place. So I'm hopeful uh, that that information as it as the attorney general evaluates it will result in in um, affecting the results of their investigation. That doesn't help Mr. Jelani. That doesn't help all the, the women who are currently suffering in jail, but but maybe there's a brighter future down the road. So that's all I would say. And thank you, okay. uh, Susan Burton and, and Dr. Grills for continuing your efforts. We've worked with the Civil Brand uh, Commission for years and uh, it's it's always been very helpful. And, and I just gotta say, it seems like you are, are stepping it up a notch. So I really appreciate your presence in these tough times when it's hard to go into the jails and it's dangerous and and uh, and so what you're doing to engage is uh, maybe not everybody knows about it, but it's having an impact and I, I greatly appreciate it. I, I think everybody seconds that uh, for especially for you, Dr. Grill and your girls and your, your tireless efforts and uh, uh, Miss Burton. Uh, you know, you're not a CNN hero for no reason, uh, you know, so we, we thank you so much for for the work that you're doing and. One of the, I just want to kind of pull together a couple of threads before we conclude the conversation. Um, we have heard about allegations of racial discrimination, obviously, on patrol in terms of uh, racial profiling, particularly in communities with substations where there are alleged deputy gangs, right? The LA Times has reported um, disproportionate bike stops of uh, Latinx people particularly in places like East Los Angeles. We've received reports of racial profiling along uh, the five freeway. And I'm sure if we looked at some of the data that's been reported by the Sheriff's Department, we would find it everywhere. Um, we've also heard reports of racial discrimination in custody uh, with respect to um, uh, the treatment of people with mental illness as we were looking at uh, how the um, HOA uh, units um, the housing units in Twin Towers uh, have been structured and the number of people who have been released under uh, some of the COVID emergency orders, Black people did not benefit as much as their representation in the, in the jails would indicate that they should have. Uh, so that's another point, a data point that we should be considering is um, Black folks, and particularly with mental illnesses, have been held in custody longer than their non-black uh, counterpart counterparts. And they haven't benefited from some of the 
uh, as much as others from some of the COVID uh, emergency population management uh, measures. And I think this is another thing that we need to be thinking about, um, looking holistically at, at the problem of uh, anti-Blackness um, in the treatment of people in LA County facilities. And so I hope that we will take up obviously this issue at the Linwood facility, but keep it in mind as part of a broader uh, uh, picture of what's happening um, in the jails. So um, we thank you for, for you know, documenting what's happening, for talking to uh, the women in the facilities, for talking to the deputies and, and the captain responsible for managing the facility. As Ms. Burton noted, right, this isn't just about you know, whether a person gets to participate in a program or not. It's about whether they can contact their children, um, which may have a bearing on whether they keep custody of their children. Right, or uh, the trauma that their children may experience if they're not able to speak to their parent on Christmas Day. Um, that also has bearing on bearings on people's recovery, on their mental health, and on their physical health. It has a bearing on their economic prospects when they're released from custody, if they're not able to participate in programs like uh, the one that's administered by A New Way of Life and Miss Burton. So um, this is a critical issue. Um, that we really need to pay attention to, particularly given that the county has uh, articulated uh, a commitment to racial equity at all levels of the county. So this seems to, to fly in the face uh, of that commitment, and I hope that the county will direct adequate resources to ensure um, that uh, Black women and Black folks, Latinx folks in this county are being treated equitably at every level and with regard to every county department, including the sheriff's department. So we thank you so much, um, uh, Ms. Burton, and thank you so much, uh, Dr. Grills, for your presentation. I hope that there will be follow-up uh, from the OIG and that we will hear some additional reporting. We will, um, I'm sure the staff will update the commission once we get a response from the sheriff's department. Uh, are there any other commissioner questions? Okay. Um, uh, Priscilla, I'd just like to say, you know, thank you for, you know, all of your insights, all of your understanding of what's been happening um, over time. We were really clear, uh, Dr. Grills and myself, when we went into the um, jail to, uh, in, to uh, do an inspection after the COVID-19 releases, that the jail was predominantly all black and that black women did not get uh, an opportunity to be released black women with health conditions uh during the COVID 19 releases it was just so clear so uh you know i'd like to just um continue to understand you know what you come up with uh how you get those uh, demographics and those numbers because uh, it's just going to be really telling. Thank you so much, and we'll we'll look forward to keeping um, uh, the public and 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 everyone uh, updated on on what's going on uh, with with our inquiry in partnership with the Office of the Inspector General. Um, uh, Dr. Grills, I think you're you're on uh, again uh, for our next conversation, uh, which is about the treatment of and, and thank you so much, Ms. Burton. Uh, if you're if you would like to log off, uh, you're more than welcome to. Of course, if you'd like to hang out and and participate, we'd love to have you. I think I'm going to get some breakfast. Okay. So I'll see you all and uh, congratulations and we're going to miss you. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. Bye -bye. All right. Uh, so our next item on the agenda is the treatment of pregnant women also at the central regional detention facility. Uh, we will hear from uh, Dr. Grills as well as Dr. Sean Henderson, the senior physician of uh, correctional health facilities. I believe that there's also another um, a representative from CHL, CHS, uh, Noah uh, Natel, um, who focuses on uh, women's health. So uh, why don't we take it in that order, uh, if, if that makes sense? Um, uh, so uh, Dr. Girls, if you can, can talk a bit about uh, your um, reporting on this issue during your audits, and then we'll uh, get a response from uh, uh, Dr. Henderson and uh, uh, Noah Natel. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. I, I, there are basically four key issues um, that we have been concerned about uh, repeatedly in um, our inspections um, focused on the uh, women who are pregnant. 
The first had to do with um, access to water and not water from the tap in the jails because there are there have been ongoing concerns about um, problems with water from the tap. Um, so in terms of water, uh, we found from the women who are pregnant. Doctor, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm wondering if you could, before you get started on sort of talking about what practices you observe, can you tell us how many pregnant women are currently in custody? It, it fluctuates. Um, and I would say it kind of hovers around 15 to 20 women, although there have been times when I've gone in and done an inspection and it was around 30. Um, but uh, I don't have the count actually today. I believe the last time I did an inspection and I actually went looking for the women because we were trying to uh, determine if some of them could be released into programming um, because of COVID concerns. Um, there were 16 women um, and that was uh, December 27th. Um, and are they housed in the same unit or are they dispersed throughout the facility, depending on, you know, security classifications and the like? Right. So at the time that I went, they were dispersed across the jail, which was, it took me longer because I had to go find each and every one of them to see if they were interested in um, getting a determination for um, early release. Um, but subsequently, I've learned that they have been moved to be. I don't know if all of them, but a large number of them into one module so that they are together. And that was um, uh, because of from what I was told, it was because OIG um, was recommending that. Um, so they, I believe they are together now. Um, so the issues that, that the women shared with, with me and other commissioners was lack of access to um, bottled water. Um, ori originally, when we were getting the concerns, they reported they were getting four bottles of water a day. Uh, and that's just, you know, the little plastic bottles of water. Um, so that was, that was um, I believe, um, dispersed across the day, one at breakfast, one at lunch, and two at dinner, bottles of water. Um, we, you know, I went and checked, you know, with, you know, the, the best practices and standards for women who are pregnant and as well as women who are pregnant while incarcerated. And that was not an adequate amount of water. Um, OIG also um, noted the same concern. And since we started raising concerns about this, they have increased the amount of bottled water to six bottles a day, two at breakfast, two at lunch, and two at dinner, um, which is an improvement. But if you need water and you're pregnant, <laughs> You should be able to have access to as much water as you need. Um, and uh, it, it would seem to me that they could figure out a procedure or a process to increase access to bottled water. The second issue um, was um, lack of um, adequate uh, exercise, time out of the cell to walk the module. Um, and so the women were, were getting tw basically 20 minutes of walking time. Um, during the regularly scheduled uh, programming time, which means that they can come out of their cells to shower and do other things. Um, I, that's been an up and down issue. It seems that it was dependent upon the discretion of the deputies who were on duty at the time as to whether or not they would give them any extra time. That just does not seem to be acceptable that depending upon the mood and discretion of, a, of an in individual deputy, whether or not women could have adequate exercise time. Um, the third uh, issue is nutrition. So um, I did meet with the manager of food services. I requested a copy of uh, a sample week's menu or menu for um, the jail for CRDF. And in that menu, what I saw was essentially a diet that was full on um, or heavy on bread and sugary foods and lean on fruits and vegetables. Um, the, uh, if I were pregnant and I was showing this to my, my doctor, I'm, I'm sure she or he would have said, and I've had three children, you need to up your game on your, on your, on your eating habits. Um, 
the uh, and so that's still an open question is, uh, but I believe OIG is meeting with um, a dietitian to try to examine more closely um, the wisdom in the current prenatal diet um, that is offered at CRDF. The other issue is shackling um, and shackling women who are pregnant while in transport. It's um, they're not supposed to be shackled to each other and walking. And if you imagine a woman in her third trimester who's carrying, you know, uh, who's who's carrying is large and the, the ability to maintain balance and gait and all of that, you know, is is tenuous. Um, doing any kind of shackling person to person would be problematic. Um, Yesterday in our meeting, we were told that that's not supposed to happen. However, we did get reports from women that it does happen. Um, and so they're shackled, to, they're supposed to be shackled independently to, I forgot what it's called, but, uh, but not to each other. Um, the other issue is um, providing the women with adequate education and support about pregnancy and delivery. Um, I, we're still trying to understand exactly what is provided, um, short of, um, I understand there are posters on the wall. Um, uh, I think we can do better than posters on the wall to, to help women prepare for delivery, to help women understand their pregnancy and how the stress that they're experiencing during pregnancy actually does translate to the nervous system of that child in utero. And that can affect that child's stress response cycle after we've got a growing body of literature and research in epigenetics and the and weathering um, that you know we need to help educate people about what's going on while pregnant and how that's affecting the baby. Um, I guess the, that that's really those are the, the major issues. I'll stop there and see if there are any questions. So what I'd like to do here is to quickly get a uh, response or comments from uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Nattel or uh, Dr. Henderson. I understand that uh, Dr. Nattel has to uh, leave at 1030. So uh, if you don't mind Dr. Henderson, I'm gonna go to Dr. Nattel for a quick sort of response, uh, yes, given that I think you're responsible for women's health. Uh, is, that, is that correct, Dr. Nattel? Yeah, but Dr. Mattel will be in charge of this entire program, so let's let him take it. Just don't take it away. Okay. I'm, I'm the director for women's health. I oversee the prenatal care. I, I, again, it's it's medical care that I'm overseeing. So the things like nutrition and exercise that we can make recommendations, those really are determined by the movement uh, you know, by custody. And so, um, you know, I've I've years ago we reviewed the the diets that. Um, I'm sorry, Dr. Nattel, before you respond, can you talk a little bit about sort of your purview and what your charge is? Uh, and then sure, for sure. I, I'm, I'm a contract physician, but I've been at the jail for about five years. Uh, originally came in um, as um, a, a contract OBGYN to provide prenatal care and routine gynecological care. Um, since 2017, uh, November of 2017, I was put um, in charge, uh, director of the women's health there. So overseeing the the pregnant population, their medical care, and ensuring that um, we're meeting best practices when it comes to that. Um, as a clinician, I'm in there about once a week, and then we have a staff of a nurse practitioner and a medical assistant who do the vast majority of the care with uh, oversight by me. And the reason why I have to duck out is every other week we have a collaborative care meeting, which I am I push back for this meeting, um, but I do wanna make sure because this is where we, the mental health team, the um, Department of Public Health and custody all kind of come together to d discuss the best uh, care for each of our patients. And a lot of that has to do with getting people out of jail because that uh, honestly we see as the best thing for their health because um, as Dr. Grills mentioned, um, the stress associated with incarceration um, not only leads to multi-generational uh, health deficits, but we're also concerned with obstetrical outcomes related to those stressors. Um, now, those stressors still exist outside of jail, but jail is just one more um, of those. And so we do want to, to prioritize um, 
movement out uh, wherever we can and facilitate that. And so we've had a great partnership with um, the Office of uh, Diversion and Rehabilitation, who has really, you know, tries hard to get each and every pregnant patient um, out of jail into their program. Um, there are few exceptions related to the charges or if somebody's already sentenced or has a program set up where they wouldn't be uh, where they wouldn't be eligible to ODR. Um, and we've also started uh, collaborating with the public defender's office to kind of provide some something medical to 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 provide uh, indication for these people to have alternatives again to incarceration. So, so Dr. Intel, I know that you your your time is short, and I wonder if you could quickly respond to um, the the uh, statements uh, that Dr. Grills made in terms of her observations and and reporting. So, in terms of bottled water, uh, only uh, pregnant women getting six eight ounce bottles a day, which is about forty eight ounces, which is deficient for any adult, uh, but certainly for someone who is pregnant. Um, exercise only about 20 minutes per day, uh, deficiencies in nutrition and shackling. Uh, have you observed these things? And if so, um, have you made recommendations uh, regarding those issues? Yeah, um, we certainly were part of the conversation that start, I mean, when I came in, there was no bottled water that that our, our patients were were getting at all. And so that was a change. The you know assumption is that the tap water is clean enough for the general population to drink, then it should be clean enough for the pregnant population to drink. That's I, I, again a thin excuse for not providing additional water to everybody. Um, I, again, I think I think we can we can see it's very easy to see the deficits when we're dealing with a pregnant population, but these deficits exist across the population that we're that that we're not providing adequate hydration for everybody, and there's there's health consequences for everybody. Um, so, uh, as far as the the food is concerned, again, I, I uh, we met with dietary years ago, and they gave us what was essentially a diet. Again, it is high in carbohydrates. Um, I think that's that's a uh, consequence of sourcing food um, and just where where the where the uh, nutrition um, uh, group gets their food. I, I don't. I, I am not in charge of that, and unfortunately, the health services don't have a lot of influence over the nutrition, um, with the exception of when there's a complaint. We elevate it to the dietary team. And, and Dr. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just, because I know you have to leave. I just want to ask, why is it not under your, why is nutrition and exercise not on your, under your purview, given that it is, re, it is critically related to health outcomes for both the pregnant person and uh, their, their potential child. Um, that seems to be tied into medical care. Why is that? Why is that not under your control? Um, yeah, I, 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 I mean, I, I, again, we don't have, we don't have a staff to of nutritionists that are available to do that, that the custody and Dr. Henderson, you can add in here, but I believe that the nutrition team is under custody or are they yeah. under CHS? Well, we can do this after you finish the things that you were asked, because that actually can answer that question. So why don't you keep going with the other, the shackles and the. So yeah. if you can get to your meeting, I don't want you to. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think, I think. So, that... so I think the last issue, so you talked about the water bottles, uh, the access to water exercise, you've observed this, but it's not under CHS's control in terms of how much exercise uh, pregnant people can uh, have per day, nor is the nutrition, although you've observed some of the deficits that Dr. Grill observed. Lastly, um, Dr. Grill's observed uh, or heard reports of shackling of women um, during transport. Uh, I, I'm also interested to know if there's been any allegations of shackling during labor and or childbirth. Um, 
as I'm sure you know, Dr. Natel, uh, state law prohibits uh, the use of shackles on pregnant women uh, unless uh, there is a flight risk or a security risk, and even then, there should the the restraint should be the least restrictive. So, what what have you observed? What what is what are your recommendations to the sheriff's department on the use of restraints on pregnant uh, people? Yeah, I think the 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 most difficult part is when um, people are being transported with with pain that may be related to labor pain or, or may not be related to labor pain. I think there is, there should be um, a uh, uh, more conservative assessment and should be a, an assumption that there could be labor happening and people should not be uh, handcuffed at that point. We do see that um, uh, on occasion people are, are handcuffed in transport to the hospital and at that, and then at the hospital it's determined whether or not they're in labor and that um, we should really look at, you know, the assumption that if somebody's complaining of any kind of abdominal discomfort during labor, there, it, it's a possibility that they're in labor, and we, or during pregnancy, it's a possibility that they're in labor or miscarrying or anything else, and we, we should be very um, uh, reticent to put, or not we, the custody should be reticent to put on uh, handcuffs for any of these individuals. Um, I definitely have heard, you know, there are, are instances where people have been handcuffed in the postpartum period and every time somebody delivers within the jail, um, I, I do a uh, review of when they were handcuffed, what the access they had was to their infant, and if there's any um, any concerns about that, I elevate that to custody and outside uh, organizations to investigate that because we take that very seriously. And we want, you know, to move the needle so that there is an assumption um, that uh, that handcuffs should not be placed if somebody's in is pregnant and uncomfortable. Right. Um, and I, I know that we've kept you five minutes over your uh, your your time. So um, we will, uh, with thanks, uh, you know, let you go um, okay. and follow up with, with additional questions. Thank you so much for being here and, and sharing your work and uh, what you're doing on behalf of pregnant folks at, at the Linwood facility. Thank um, you. I'm going to jump back on in about 10 minutes um, or, or 15 minutes if I can get through my other meeting. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, uh, so we have some questions, uh, Commissioner Giggins. And so if you have questions, uh, you can probably ask them to Dr. Henderson. Uh, you're muted. A quick, a quick clarifying question, uh, because when I hear shackling, I think of beyond handcuffs. I think of maybe feet being tied or legs being um, cuffed. Uh, does that? Does someone know? Does um, Possibly, well, Dr. Uh, Mills, if someone could speak to that, is that my what understanding? Do you mean by uh, my understanding, Commissioner Giggins, is the use of uh, handcuffs. So it could be at the wrists, it could be around the waist, it could be around the ankle, it could be all three of those. Uh, so any combination is shackling um, okay. in terms of the the popular usage of that term. Uh, so, the handcuffs would constitute in the front of a person uh, who's pregnant would constitute shackles. Thank you. Dr. Henderson, is, is that correct uh, from, from your understanding? Uh, maybe Dr. Dr. Henderson can't connect. Dr. Grills, is that your understanding? Is that the way that you were using the term? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think that's consistent with state law as well. Um, uh, so let's, let's take additional uh, commissioner questions. Are there are there questions for uh, Dr. Grills or for Dr. Henderson? Dr. Henderson, are you there? Yes, ma'am. I'm trying to get on the phone because I heard you on the record, but I can't unmute it on the phone. So um, I'm trying the best I can here. <laughs> okay, I think you're a little clearer, you're a little clearer now. Okay, that's wonderful. Okay, so, so I just wanted to follow up on the question I asked um, Dr. Natel, which is why isn't the HS in charge of things like nutrition, exercise, uh, restraints? Um, it's, it's puzzling to me that there would be any restraints on uh, pregnant women during transport because the because state law requires that there be some risk of flight or harm to custody staff or, or other members of the public. And I, I just can't imagine that a, a a pregnant woman in a third trimester would be any of those things. So, um, um, you know, sort of what your response is to to the first question, 
about why supposed to shackle um or handcuff the pregnant woman. So then we look at each time we find them. Oh, I'm so sorry, uh Dr. Henderson. You don't sound your audio. This your is audio. Jennifer. I just want to interject. Dr. Henderson, if you can reach out to me, this is Jennifer Wicks. We'll try to get your audio connected. Uh we are unable to hear you clearly now. I I will reach out to him, Chair Ocean. Okay, um, so so let me just uh, say this. I I, um, I, I believe that uh, the OIG is uh, conducting an inquiry. Uh, so uh, Max, I'm wondering if you can uh, describe what you are doing or what you plan to do. I know you can't come to any conclusions without uh, a completed report, but uh, if you can update the commission on uh, what efforts your office is engaging in around um, the treatment. Of course, of I mean as you say, we're we're not we're not finished, uh, and Assistant Inspector General Belts is in charge of this. Uh, Valencia uh, Boyd is also, uh, I think, all present um, today, but not a, on a, one of the speaking panelists. Uh, so we're work we are working on that issue and have been for a long time, years, I guess, uh, about pregnancy pregnancy in jail. It is, as the doctor said, the best uh, prescription is to be released. There are some limitations on release. Of course, during COVID, we've advocated for aggressive release policies for low-level offenses where people are simply going to be in jail, be given COVID, and then released in a short period of time. It would be much wiser to release them sooner rather than later. But there's a range of, of offenses, and so you have to deal with that problem. And that gets into what Susan Burton was talking about with the Sheriff's Department's policies regarding who they're willing to release and who they're not. The Sheriff made a, a statement publicly some time ago that no pregnant woman should be in custody. But he has not actually, um, it wasn't actually in alignment with Sheriff's Department practice and our, the number of women in pregnant uh, pregnant women in custody continues to be substantial. So we've worked for a long time, uh, certainly during COVID and to some extent pre-COVID um, on this issue. And we will be reporting some things about it, uh, I think in our next quarterly report in the same way that we're addressing the racial discrimination issue. But um, one thing I wanted to clarify in the meantime is uh, the doctor spoke about uh, the appropriateness of the bottled water and the amount of water drunk and the fact that that's a problem in our general population as well. That's absolutely true. However, the, the, for anybody listening to this issue, there is a sink in every jail cell and it would be great if people could drink from it. The problem is it's not. Uh, comparable to the water that people drink outside of the jail. We have had repeatedly over the years a problem with maggots infesting those sinks. And a as a result, uh, the people in the prisoners who are there do not believe that the water is safe to drink. This is very much like Flint, Michigan. They, they won't drink it because they believe that if they drink that water, uh, it will have a negative impact on their baby. So you have a pregnant woman sitting in a cell uh, who does not have access to water that she is willing to drink. And so that's why we have the need for, for the bottled water. It's not like we're just deciding, oh, you know, we're, we're too hoity-toity to drink um, the water that everybody else drinks. That's not at all. It's a long-term problem in the facility. And we have worked with the department for years to try to uh, address that problem unsuccessfully. And the department, I think, has made an effort to try to clean uh, the drainage system in the sinks consensus is we can keep on this, we can do the best we can, but we're never going to solve this problem. So we have, it's a fundamental facilities problem that, that is being addressed by the bottled water. So that's why the, the water needs to be supplied by bottled is because the county's failure to provide uh, water that is consistently um, something people would be willing to drink. And and so, as a, and, and I agree with the chair sort of suggested uh, position that, you know, when conditions are unacceptable for a patient, uh, it was in custody that the medical doctor should make orders uh, that then should be followed, and that covers both handcuffing and um, nutrition, including including water. Uh, and and um, uh, Mr. Huntsman, I hope that as your office conducts its inquiry, that you will also uh, discuss um, potential liability for the county uh, in terms of the provision of uh, medical care and the treatment of pregnant people. Right, this what I'm hearing. If there, particularly if there are negative pregnancy outcomes, um, could constitute a violation of the Eighth Amendment. 
um, and the counties uh, or the fourth and the fourth and fifth amendment and the county's responsibility to provide adequate uh, medical care, particularly when they've been put on notice about uh, problems. So uh, I hope that you'll you'll um, engage in some form of analysis around that as as well as the county's authority to release people, um, uh, particularly folks who who are pregnant, as as the sheriff indicated that he he wanted to do. Um, uh, Dr. Henderson, are are you here? Can you hear me now? Oh my gosh, that is so much better. Yes, <laughs> um, it's sort of like when you're like scratching on a chalkboard and then it I stops. Know. It's wonderful, um, uh, Dr. Henderson. So, so can you talk a bit about um, uh, your response to some of the uh, concerns that were raised by Dr. Grills and the question about why CHS is not uh, responsible for things like water, exercise, nutrition and uh, shackling. Correct. So CHS, remember, is only about four or five years old. And when the decision to move health care under the Department of Health Services was made, we assumed the care for all those things that would typically be under Title 22. And the things that were under Title 15 remained with the Sheriff's Department. And things like diet remained with the Sheriff's Department. Um, we don't do medical restraints at all period. Uh, they're not allowed in the jail, but we don't have control over custody restraints. That's just, you know, we don't have control over the where of the population. We have a control over their health, and we've, we just, we're not in charge of telling people where to house them. We don't do housing. We've never had that responsibility or um, even opportunity. I'm not sure, you know, it's very complicated. I'm not sure I would want the opportunity, but it, it's not ever been discussed. Dietary still stays under the sheriff, and um, exercise is the kind of is another where thing. You know, letting them out of their cells is not my call. I can make recommendations, but I'm not in charge of their custodial the custodial piece, the residential piece. Um, and just to, while he's not here, I can say nice things about him, Doctor. Dr. Mattel has done wonders with the population and is very invested. Um, he does report to us every time somebody he's shackled or doesn't get what they need. And he was instrumental in increasing the, the <clears throat> pregnant patient's uh, outcomes and really making it you know, as bearable as is possible in custody for that population. So uh, I hope he comes back because he has a lot of information for you. Thank you. Um, uh -huh. uh, are, are you also um, able to uh, discuss sort of what your ideal, in other words, has your, your office um, made recommendations regarding how this needs to be structured in terms of the treatment of pregnant women in custody, or is it sort of on an ad hoc basis as problems arise? No, no, he's, he's the meeting he left us for is just that meeting. He's meeting with all the other departments and they meet with custody in a similar fashion. Um, no, we, we make recommendations on an ongoing basis about how to improve the care, how to, how to make things um, better. And obviously not having them in custody is number one, but now that they're in custody, what do we do while they're with us? How do we improve their outcomes? How do we make, how do we minimize that, that risk factor that is being in custody? And Dr. Natal and Dr. Cardenas, who's our director of uh, health services in that facility, work tirelessly to, to give, to meet with custody and make recommendations and try and make it as well, I, I hate to say it because it sounds ridiculous, but as you know, as bearable as possible. Um, I asked uh, Dr. Grills um, about the number of pregnant women who are in custody, and her estimate was that between 15 and 20, around 16, were in custody at the time that she visited the facility in December. Do you have up to date numbers on uh, how many pregnant women are in custody? Dr. Cardenas, are you there? I don't know if he's here, but if he's the director down there. We run an ongoing um, share drive, and I, I can get into it and tell you exactly on and on what it is, but he would know he's not there. Are you referring uh, to Charlie Cardenas? Yes. Okay, let me go ahead and unmute him. Thank you. Charlie, you were unmuted. Thank you. Sorry, I was trying to talk, and I just couldn't get through. Um, we have 16 as of this morning. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Cardenas, um, do you happen to know what the outcomes are for pregnant women in the in in custody who say 
give birth or give birth after their release, do you happen to know what those outcomes are in comparison to people who haven't been in custody and, and, and give birth? Part of the reason why I ask is that, for example, black women have disproportionately higher um, negative pregnancy outcomes compared to their uh, white counterparts. And obviously we know that black women are disproportionately represented in the jails. And the additional layer of incarceration, the additional layer of these lack of water, exercise, nutrition, and practices like shackling, I imagine exacerbate um, the underlying stressors which may contribute to heightened pregnancy outcomes. So that's my question. It, is that something that you have observed either with the women who give birth while in custody or who give birth after they're released? Um, or do you keep track of that information? We keep track of outcomes um, that we can keep track of. So people that are released that go out into the community, we often don't know what happens. Um, but the, set, the, the outcomes we know about, which is C-sections versus vaginal births, um, which is probably the simplest way to, to, to look at things. It doesn't, com it doesn't paint a complete picture, but it is one way we look at things. We are comparable, if not a little bit better than the community um, in terms of uh, spontaneous vaginal deliveries versus primary C-sections. Um, after this all comes back, he can speak more on that, but we, it's something we do look at and keep track of. Okay, and I, and I think it would be great if we could get information about that for a period of years. Um, are there any other, I monopolize that, but hey, it's my last meeting, so this is what's gonna happen. Um, so are are there any questions from commissioners? Any the next item, and can everyone make sure they're muted if they're not speaking, because I think there's, someone is sighing into the into their microphone any questions uh commissioner kennedy and commissioner gigan uh thank you i i just had a question if um if an issue like lack of water or lack of exercise is impacting the health of a pregnant uh woman in custody is there no procedure for the doctors to weigh in I understand there's different titles that you mentioned, but if it's impacting the patient's health, shouldn't there be a vehicle for the doctors to weigh in and and uh, and change that? We would agree with you. I think um, there just is no mechanism at this time. I have input on the diet in terms of it's kind of an annual review of diet, but I can't, we have no mechanism. I don't think we can add certain things to diets, but the bottled water issue was a Dr. Cardenas, you might want to flesh out the bottled water because that was a hot button issue. Was it not for a while? It was, and it, it still is. I mean, I think it's been said uh, multiple times during this conversation that um, there's a, whether it's true or not, and I actually I have my own opinions on it. There is a perception that the water from the tap is not drinkable for anybody, for pregnant women, non-pregnant women, and so, like Dr. Natel mentioned, there was an agreement to provide two bottles of water per meal for the pregnant women. So, working within those constraints, when we we talk to the women and they're not getting what they're essentially were promised or what we've promised to them. We, we nag, we call, we call up to the module, we call the deputies, call the custody leadership and try to get them what they should have within those constraints. Um, specifically regarding the question you just asked, uh, like Dr. Henderson said, I agree 100%. It's just, it, it's, a, it's a tough one. Um, we, we are definitely working within some limitations to what we have control over and what we don't have control over. Thank you. Um, Commissioner uh, Gigant. Wow. Um, I'm kind of sitting here, if I just might make a comment, I'm just kind of astonished. Nobody has any control. Oversight doesn't matter. Can't change anything. We barking at the moon. This is one of the more depressing meetings I've been at in a while. Anyway, I'm just making that comment. I'm sure other people are feeling similarly. But I would like to, I did, I did not think I got the number. How many at an average, how many pregnant women are we talking about on an average at any given time who are not giving adequate, who are not getting adequate nutrition, water, or exercise? How many women are we talking about? Dr. Cardenas, you know better than I. 
I, I um, honestly can't give you a number. We we listen to the women and we hear them, and it just varies. Uh, it varies on on at any given time. Um, who, so I'm talking about how many women, how many pregnant women are there at any okay. given time? What's the average? Yeah, what's the average? I mean, I assume that you would know that, right? Even if you no, can tell I us. Definitely know that. So right now there are 16. After um, once the pandemic, once COVID started, um, we've ranged anywhere from 15 to 25 um, ballpark numbers. Pre-COVID, we're upwards in the 30s often, um, sometimes in the low 40s. Um, but like I said, since since uh, since the pandemic began, uh, and especially in recent uh, probably the last last six months, we've ranged anywhere from fifteen to to low twenties. And and Dr. Cardenas, and I'll go to you, uh, Commissioner Ruman. Do you happen to know um, what kind of charges uh, these women are facing, and, and why? Uh, given that Dr. Natel, and welcome back, Dr. Natel. Um, has has pushed for for women to be released. Why they haven't been? And I apologize for asking you. Unfortunately, we did at we did um, invite the sheriff's department to attend and to speak to this issue. They declined. Um, uh, as I said, Assistant Sheriff Corbett uh, graciously agreed to appear to talk about COVID nineteen, but um, uh, we did not get a subject matter expert on on this issue. So uh, we're asking you if you happen to know about the charges or Dr. Grills, uh, if you spoke to the women and they disclosed this, um, I'm just trying to get a sense of why they're not being released. Um, I can I can tell you that I, I try not to look into individual charges for anybody we're seeing. Uh, what I've been told or have heard from custody is that these are high serious charges. Um, what serious means, I don't know and I can't define, but that they're charges that make make it release difficult. And that's just what I hear. I haven't looked into it. I haven't explored it. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Rubin. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you all. And I share Commissioner Giggins and, and Commissioner Kennedy's uh, amazement that, you know, everybody, I mean, uh, people are doing their best in order to provide assistance, but there just doesn't seem to be any overall um, responsibility. And whether that's because of Title 22 or 15 or whatever it is, it's um, it's it's uh, extremely difficult and impossible for the for the women at CDRF to exist in this in this environment. And so um, I throw this out to um, Inspector General Huntsman, and I know that, you know, you're in the midst of um, getting uh, your fourth quarterly report and discussing this issue, but I hope that one of the things that you'll um, be able to offer an opinion on is um, the fact that there ought to be one overarching um, area that is responsible for all of these issues and not saying, well, this is not in my purview and so I can't. Um, and again, I'm not being critical of Dr. Henderson or Dr. Natal or, or anybody else. And I understand your hands are tied, but this calls out for uh, a reevaluation as to how, these, um, how the system is monitored. So it's not a question of anybody in particular unless Mr. Huntsman wants to respond, but um, I'm throwing it out to uh, to him and the Inspector General's office. We need to have this restructured. Well, I'll happily respond briefly, which is um, kind of a repeat. I've been saying for years uh, when when we uh, brought down Terry McDonald from the from the state. Uh, the first thing she did when she looked at our jails was said, you know, the problems here in the delivery of medical care are worse than than the state had. That's to remind people the reason we have what we call criminal justice reform is because the federal government sued the state of California and required them to release inmates because the medical care was unconstitutional. And so they had to release people and that then got packaged up as a, a reform to our justice system. But it was triggered by our inability to care for people in our custody at the state level. And 
ever since Terry McDonald got here, I have been of the opinion that, and, and that's around the time when I started too, I started a little before that, that the medical care we give in these jails is also unacceptable in a variety of ways, which I've reported on repeatedly. And I believe that someday somebody will sue us and force us to. And right now, the Attorney General is conducting a pattern and practice investigation, which asks the question, is there a pattern of conduct such as we have the doctors here who say, this is how my patients should be treated and we have custody over here not doing it. That's a practice. And if that then violates people's constitutional rights, such as the Eighth Amendment's protection against cruel and unusual punishment, which I believe one could make an argument for, then we have a constitutional violation. And that's currently uh, being actively investigated by state DOJ. So we will certainly opine, as we have repeatedly, as I am right now, that uh, something is rotten in the state of Denmark, and it isn't just the maggots inside the, the uh, drains. But we've been saying that for years, and nobody has listened. I have found that this sheriff in particular, and this county in general, only operates in the legal realm. So when a court says it, then something will happen. Until then, we will have this practice, and I agree, it should be centralized, but I share um, Commissioner Kennedy's shock that when a doctor says, you know, they, this is what should happen, that there's any question as to whether or not those bottles show up. There sh it shouldn't be necessary for anybody to beat this horse over and over, as my staff have done. Um, it, that shouldn't be necessary, and yet it is over and over, and that's the underlying pattern and practice that we're facing here. Thank you all so much. So um, we have uh, many. Uh, we have one more question, and then I think uh, Dr. Grills has to log off. Um, so, uh, Commissioner Harris. Well, this isn't a question, but it's just a general comment. Um, it was stated here today that the sheriff has made a statement previously that he didn't believe any pregnant women should be in custody, and I think it would be nice to have the sheriff perhaps. Um, articulate then why do we still have them there if that is his position. I understand, you know, sometimes the charges make it difficult to release people. But you know, he's made that statement. Uh, I would like to hear from him sometime, uh, or if not from him, to one of his subordinates, why that was impossible to happen. Because I happen to agree with his alleged statement that it'd be nice not to have any pregnant women in custody. That said, I know um, we have Assistant Sheriff Corbett here today, and although he is not here to address this, um, I just feel that this issue of providing pregnant women with water and good nutrition while they're in our custody shouldn't take an act of Congress to happen. He is the assistant sheriff in charge of custody. If he can't make it happen, I don't know who can. And I know that Assistant Sheriff Corbett is a, is a, is a good human being, and I know he's doing everything he can uh, within his power. Uh, and I know there's Title 15 and Title 22, and that's all well and good. But just common decency tells me we ought to be able to figure out a way to get enough bottled water to 15 pregnant women at CRDF and enough good nutritional food for them to take while they're in our custody. I don't think that takes an act of Congress. So that's just my statement. Uh, Assistant Chair Corbett, did you want to respond or, or would you prefer to wait until, until the COVID-19 item? Either way, uh, Commissioner, I, I could address some of these again. Um, as you mentioned, I'm not the SME and know the exact details. I know all the efforts we're doing to find uh, the pregnant females in our care. Alternatives in the community, ankle monitoring or placement or whatever we can do. We're working with all of our CBOs in the community. We review the list weekly. And as you've all indicated, it is basically statutory authority that they're in our care remanded by the court. And their charge level is actually preventing some of these community based organizations from accepting them. Anything alleged, charged with, not guilty of, charged with anything for murder, assault with a deadly weapon, robberies, all serious and violent felonies, which is one of the, um, I guess, for lack of a better term, the uh, unattended consequence of some of our COVID depopulation efforts. 
the population we're left with, as the doctor mentioned, we were at 30 or 40 pregnant females. Now we're down to 15 or 16, looking at more serious charges, which is difficult for them to um, find placement in the community. But we do review that very robustly weekly. And we, even those that didn't qualify the week before, we look at it again in case their charge level came down. This is an ongoing process we continually do to try to get them out of the jail into a community bed. Um, I hope that answers some of the, we're not turning a blind eye for lack of a better term. Um, I, I have to disagree a little bit with Dr. Henderson and I, I like Sean, I respect the heck out of him. Uh, he's done an, and we'll talk about what they've done for COVID in a minute here, but there are medically ordered diets. There are medically ordered diets for diabetics, for you know, gluten and type of things. So we do follow medical uh, order for diets. That does happen. There's religious order diets for people that have restrictions for med uh, religious reasons. We have all that. So there are things in place, but, and you know, I'll get into this in a minute, but let's not forget as we're addressing all this, that we are under a pandemic. So quarantines and rolling quarantines do affect how some of the movement, some of the, uh, the, the things we can offer for out of cell time and that are a little restricted because of the quarantine. Not an excuse, just an explanation. But as far as the pregnant females, we take that very seriously. We work with uh, with all the doctors involved. Dr. Natel has been great uh, with the doulas, with the water, with all these other practices that we, we try to improve on all the time. And, and we listen to that. And I, I could speak for the sheriff when he, he says, yeah, we would prefer them not to be in our, our custody. A pregnant female, but we are restricted by legal standards that they have been remanded to us and we need to do the best we can to to protect them while they're in our care. Uh, Dr. Grills, I saw you raise your hand. I just wanted to mention, I didn't add this to my list of things for the pregnant women because we're still trying to investigate it, but I feel like I should share it now. Um, and that is for the pregnant women there appears to be um, extensive delays uh, in in moving women who qualify to be moved to some kind of community um, um, uh, option. And, and it's like 60 plus days of delay once it's determined that they can be moved um, to when they actually are. And apparently that's under um, ODR, the Office of Diversion and Rehabilitation. Um, and as I said, we're still trying to investigate it, but we have been um, noticed, notified several times about these extensive delays when women could be moved out of the jail. And, and Dr. Rill, is there any overlap with the comments you made about racial discrimination? In other words, um, are the pregnant women, what's the racial demographic of the, pre of the pregnant women? Uh, you know, I, I ask that every time I go in and every time I ask anything for racial, um, or any kind of demographic breakdown, it ends up becoming difficult. The, the overall, the jail has a real problem with, um, data management, um, and data systems that are easy to, um, use to generate information. So I can't tell you at this moment. Uh, even at that particular day that I actually went around to try to locate the 16 women who were pregnant. And by the way, the jail told me there were 15. The women told me, oh, there's a 16th woman. Do, do you, you don't have her on your list? And I'm like, oh, no, she wasn't on the list. So I, I think we've got a, a huge problem with data um, systems and data analytics for the jail. So basic questions like that are not easy to answer. Okay. Um, uh, so last question for Commissioner Rubin, and then we'll, we'll try to not, uh, end this conversation, but, uh, table it. And I'm certain we'll, we'll have additional conversations as the OIG presents their findings. Uh, Commissioner Rubin. Um, thank you. Um, I want to ask, um, assistant chief Corbett, you have overall custody responsibility supervision. Um, what about, um. The, the earlier discussion, and I know that you were present when um, uh, there was um, discussion from Susan Burton and also um, Cheryl Grills about um, the, um, the, the racial 
concerns and uh, the, the six deputies who had been identified um, and uh, Commander um, Montoya and um, uh, Mr. Macias, it, it's, I have to believe it has um, risen to your level. Um, and if it hasn't, uh, what can you do to get involved to um, to solve this issue and get these um, investigations uh, moving along um, so that we don't continue to hear this? Actually, it's a great question, Commissioner. I was listening to Ms. Burton. I heard her frustration and, and Dr. Grill's um, presentation. I know I have full confidence in Commander Macias and Captain Montoya. But here's what I, I would uh, offer, and I'll set up a meeting with uh, Dr. Grills and uh, OIG and even a member of the COC if they'd like to, so we can we can do a good deep dive. There was a lot of things mentioned, a lot of different nuances. Um, and I would be happy to, to meet with her uh, and discuss all these and look at point by point what we can address, what we could. Some things are, are delayed, and I, I think what she was trying to Maybe it wasn't explained uh, enough if there's a grievance, a personnel grievance against a staff member. There's a process of an inquiry and then an IA investigation. There's a process involved to to get that done. I think that may be what they were trying to be explained to her. You can't just jump from A to Z. There is a process. I would be happy to meet with the doctor and and uh, a member from OIG, COC, and we could discuss all this so we can get to the bottom of it. Absolutely. Um, I on that. Yeah, I understand if if there's, you know, that there's a process and the process is significant. But in the meantime, um, there are serious complaints against six deputies. And it seems to me that um, if the department takes these complaints seriously, that there at least ought to be some, I don't know, movement. Um, but um, at, at least, at, at least temporarily, until the investigation is resolved. I, I, you can't, you can't have six deputies against whom there are serious complaints um, still in the same uh, position in the same facility, and now it's risen to concerns about retaliation and other things. And uh, and I would hope that um, at your level. Um, you could at least temporarily move these six deputies. Well, I'll look into that, Commissioner. It might have already happened. Um, I apologize that I don't know enough on the details in the investigation. Again, I wasn't prepared to address that, but I did hear Ms. Burton. I hear Dr. Grills. I hear your concern, and I'll, I will take it to, the, to my level immediately. Not a problem. Thank you all very much. So we're we're gonna uh, pause the conversation here uh, um, uh, because, okay, Commissioner Giggins, last last point because folks have to log off and we have a number of different other guests uh, joining us. You're muted, Commissioner. Uh, um, I'm glad, uh, you know, Corbett, that you're willing to meet with everyone and get to um, move things along, which I hope will happen. Um, but is there a way to get everybody out of there in terms of the pregnant women? I mean, just is it because I just heard that it's it's ODR also. It takes sixty days. Um, anyway, I'm just putting that out there. That should if that if that has been the goal and that and the sheriff wants that, um, if ODR wants that, it seems that if everyone is of one mind, then a policy could be created. I'm just putting that out there because this has been a uh, extremely challenging. Um, um, set of events to hear about. Thank you. All right, so it sounds like the commission um, will uh, follow up with assistant chair Corbett uh, to hopefully convene a working group uh, to discuss some of these issues and, and resolution um, along with the OIG's inquiry and, and hopefully by next month we'll have some additional information and uh, movement. Okay, um, I, uh, Commissioner Rubin, I saw your note about a break, uh, but because we have some time limits with our speakers, we're gonna take the next issue, which is COVID-19 in the jails, and, uh, and then we will take a break and then come back and hear public comment. 
Okay, uh, so um, thank you so much, uh, Commissioner, uh, Commissioner, Vice Chair of the Civil Brand Commission, uh, Commi uh, Commissioner Grills, thank you so much for being here. Thank you to CHS, thank you to Dr. Henderson, Dr. Natel uh, for joining us and thank you for your work on behalf of uh, folks in custody. Um, given that, you know, most of us uh, can't go into these facilities, um, the fact that you all are there really helps us to understand what's happening. And thank you for, for your witness. Um, we'll now move to uh, our third item under uh, uh, our agenda item B, uh, which is conditions of confinement in LA County jails. Um, obviously, you know, we are still in the midst of an unprecedented uh, pandemic. Uh, the jails are a congregate environment um, uh, where uh, respiratory uh, viruses like COVID can spread rapidly, especially when you have a um, particularly transmissible variant like Omicron. And so we wanna hear from uh, the Sheriff's Department about the efforts that they're engaged in. Um, and then we'll also hear from uh, CHS about um, uh, their work uh, to manage COVID-19 in the jails and to reduce rates of transmission, serious illness and uh, death. So uh, uh, Assistant Sheriff Corbett, if you don't mind, I'd like to start with you. If you could talk a bit about sort of where uh, you are in terms of the population, uh, COVID uh, rates uh, and how it's how COVID is being managed in the jails, and then we'll hear from um, uh, Dr. Henderson. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I, I know we presented this back, I believe, in uh, September of 2021. Our, our efforts that we we had ongoing, uh, we've had a few good updates on that, and, and a few things, and I think Dr. Henderson can expand on a lot of that. Um, so. First off, let me remind everybody, we've been dealing with this since March of 2020. We're almost two years into this. So, you know, we seem to, to forget how prolonged this has been and some of the frustration everybody has with, with the process. But, boy, we're two years into this. It, this has not gone away. And obviously, we've, we've cycled during that with, with our population up and down. Uh, when we began this, we were at 17,404 inmates. Uh, today, I'm at approximately 13,000. I've been under 13,000, but with the recent uh, spike and the effect of the quarantines, and I'm looking around at a number, um, I'm at 3,700 uh, inmates quarantined today because of this recent spike. So the problem with that is it, it kind of restricts their ability to get to court, so it delays things. Um, so hopefully um, I'll let Dr. Henderson talk about that. Um, Everything we've done to depopulate, to early release, percentage release, none of that has changed. We've been working with our justice partners since the onset of this, providing them lists for uh, stipulation of release with the justice partners. Um, and again, when somebody's remanded to my cu our custody from the judge, we're obligated to take them in. So um, a couple of things that has changed dramatically since the onset, I don't know if you remember when we first came across COVID, we didn't have the testing capability um, on intake. We just didn't have the turnaround. We didn't have the, the capacity. Uh, Dr. Henderson and his team is now, we have an on-site lab. We're testing everybody that comes into our care. Uh, so we're able to identify in a matter of hours whether they're um, COVID positive or not. And that's been a game changer for us to restrict them from going into the population and cohorting them and isolating them before they go in. Um, that's that's been a huge take for us. Um, and as we've talked about, um, even though our capacity of, of inmates is reduced dramatically, three to four thousand, we've never shut down any of our available housing areas. We left everything open. And the thought behind that, as you as indicated, is to spread them out, not cohort, no, not congregate, and and collapse them into smaller areas. We're, we're um, that's ongoing, that's gonna to continue to be ongoing. Uh, the other thing that in Dr. Henderson I'll talk about um, is the vaccination program, getting everybody vaccinated in our custody. I'll let the doctor talk about those numbers. Uh, we had activated our emergency operations center in custody uh, in March of 2020. And it's been running 24 hours, seven days a week ever since then. And basically all of our, um, our responses, our actions, the quarantines coming, the quarantines going, is all controlled through one centralized area, which has been a big help with us. Because then we can um, 
accidentally somebody doesn't get moved from one area to another. We're, we're in full control of who's going where and how they're going. Uh, we've been working with Correction and Health Services as this is going on with different um, requirements. I know just recently um, it was identified the cloth mask we have been providing were not adequate. So we're getting K95s for everybody um, or surgical masks uh, in addition to the cloth mask. So um, the masking is, is a requirement. We recently, within the last month or so, uh, been able to reduce our state prison population back to normal numbers. We were at 3,000 at one point because state prison had closed down to us. We moved all of, almost all of them out. Uh, state prison has uh, restricted their intake for the last couple of weeks for males. Uh, females can still go, but the males, they because they are undergoing the same spike we are with the Omicron. So, but we're we're at a manageable level. Um, we're under a thousand for total. We're about six hundred for males ready to go, which at one point again, like that saying, we were at three thousand. So that's helping us manage our population also. Um, trying to think of any. We, we're continually trying to um, educate. You know, um, the inmates. We do town halls. We we uh, try to change the signage up for how important the masks are, cleanliness, because if you walk by the same sign every day, after a while you don't see it. So we try to change the colors, we try to change the signage, we try to continue with the town halls. Um, we actually just three weeks ago when we started seeing this increase again in this variant, um, we directed our sergeants to go in and when an area is under quarantine, go in, notify the inmates they're under quarantine, why they're under quarantine, and if they have any additional questions, We'll refer it to CHS to come up and, and direct that to them. So again, I know we talked earlier about um, education and, um, and information, and we think that's important in this too. Um, last May and then subsequently June, we've uh, opened back up our visiting centers. Uh, Dr. Henderson has identified some ways we can uh, identify ways to do programming in smaller groups that are cohorted within their own uh, population. So I know we were talking earlier about uh, programming at CRDF and other things. Uh, I just, please keep in the back of your mind, programming has been significantly hampered because of COVID. And again, we're two years into this. We can't get a lot of vendors in. Uh, we can't have big groups of people coming together from different housing areas. And all of that is in an effort to, to stop the spread. Um, and if I'm going too fast, let me know if you have any questions as we're going. Um, I think that is, again, we're working with our justice partners because we all understand that, that um, trying to get people out is the best way to mitigate it. However, statutory authority and, and the laws, we're limited in what we can do. Um, we are working, I'm working with uh, Brandon Nichols from the JSIT on a program to possibly uh, look at pretrial releases. Um, which is a little bit more difficult and restrictive with the law, but I think we can have some workarounds to maybe get anywhere from 500 or 1,000 pretrials uh, released on an ankle monitoring program and get them into, um, I know Judge uh, Armstead at ATI is working with us to maybe try to place some of them. So these are all the efforts we're doing to try to mitigate the COVID in here. Um, Dr. Henderson and Dr. Belovich and I meet weekly. So we strategize about how we could best do things, change things up. Um, you know, some of the some of the frustrations they have. Um, I know at CRDF when they're talking about out of cell time and this and that, is you know, some of these people just don't want to come out. So we can't force them, but education is the key, and try to get them out and try to support them with that. So we're looking at that. And again, this is not an excuse, but ex explanation. I've um, my staffing levels have significantly been hampered. Uh, we have personnel that are out with COVID and we've had, uh, lack of a better term, significant budget curtailments and staffing curtailments that uh, we've been dealing with for the past year or so. So we're trying to do more with less, um, but that does not mitigate our commitment to this and to make sure that anybody in our custody is uh, safe and, and given the best treatment that we can. So unless I have any other questions, I'd like to turn that over then to Dr. Henderson for their end of this.
Okay, I can ask a question of uh, Assistant Chair Corbett. Uh, actually, if, if we could just take Dr. Henderson uh, and then we'll take all the questions because we're, uh, we want to take a break and we also, we also want to hear from public comments. So we'll, we'll take Dr. Henderson next. Dr. Henderson. Ma'am, so I'm just going to answer the questions that were put on the agenda, but it's a lot of data and I don't mind sending it to you, um, in a, not you personally, but whoever you tell me to, because um, it's a bunch of tables. Um, <clears throat> the current number of positive COVID cases in each jail facility varies from uh, 23 uh, in the CTC 11 in Tower 1 up to 114, 197 in the other areas. So I think I may, this, this may be better off me sending you a table um, that you can share amongst yourselves to get the real feel for the data. I did a snapshot from January 18th. If that's okay, I mean I can go through it, but it's it's a little dense. You know, it's a lot of it's a lot of data. If you could, if you could tell us sort of generally how many people uh, are currently uh, COVID positive, symptomatic, asymptomatic, uh, how many are in isolation, and how many uh, people are under uh, some some form of uh, quarantine. Um, so quarantine. And, if there, and then just lastly, if there's anything you want to add to what Assistant Chair Corbett said about sort of management vaccination testing, uh, things of that nature. Sure. So there's 445 people currently positive. Uh, I do not separate asymptomatics from symptomatics because they all have to be treated the same way. It doesn't matter if you have symptoms or not. I have to watch the symptomatics a little closer. I have staff to do that. But to me, they're, they're positive, so we have to treat them all with surveillance, checking on them to make sure, because a symptomatic, an asymptomatic today could be a symptomatic tomorrow. I know it sounds kind of goofy, but it's true, right? The disease <clears throat> progresses over time. So just because you test positive and don't have any symptoms doesn't mean that tomorrow you won't be um, really ill. Um, you also asked a question about the number of deaths since the onset of pandemic, and the answer is 17. Um, we've lost, we've lost uh, about eight or nine people the first year. And then over this winter surge, um, we lost another six or seven. Uh, that was last winter in 20, uh, 2020, 2021. And we've lost one um, since the winter surge of 2020, 2021. Uh, this disease, this variant is not as, it, just like in the community, does not appear to be as severe. We're not getting the same sort of hospital uh, flow that we had when we were in the Delta or in last winter. So um, we have many more asymptomatics than symptomatics. Um, quarantine and isolation, uh, I don't do those numbers. Quarantine is, the, the, the assistant sheriff mentioned it was somewhere around 3,700. Um, we have vaccinated um, 15,000 different inmates. We've offered almost 60,000 vaccines uh, because of the Transit, not transitory, but because our population is not stable, people coming in and out at any given time, we have about 50% of the population who is fully vaccinated. That's two shots in a two week period, you know, two shots followed by two weeks, um, about 50%. And that includes people who are immunized in the community and come into our care and people that we actually do the vaccines for. We've given um, 3000 boosters. And we continue to do that on an ongoing basis. And we changed our process so that we can give you a first or second vaccine. It's actually the first we're focused on. We can get you a first vaccine within 48 hours of request. So if you come to the IRC, the reception center, and we ask, we ask everybody if you'd like a shot, if you say yes, someone will be at your cell or we'll find you within 48 hours to give it. We strive for 24, but occasionally with weekends, it takes 48. Um, the other thing to mention to the commission, just for a point of information, is when when the winter surge of 2021 decreased, when the number of cases fell, we took some steps forward. We let some vendors in. We opened up visiting hours. We uh, started some group sessions for um, the substance use programs. And um, when Omicron hit, what we are doing is we're holding our ground. We're not backing up. I think that um, it's been two years. Our population needs these services. The disease does not appear to be as severe. We all have new behaviors with masking and 
social distancing, and we have some good penetrance with vaccinations. And um, the, our vaccinated population is allowed to go to group, um, if provided they wear masks and they have no symptoms, and that the vendors coming in are all vaccinated and also keep their distance and wear masks and are asymptomatic. So um, when when you hear that we may have a few more you know cases of asymptomatic, we didn't lock down this time because it's we've decided to just kind of hold our ground. We're not going to advance, but we're not going to we're not going to pull all the way back because this this variant seems less virulent, and um, we desperately need to provide services, activities, um, you know, resources to the patient population. So I just wanted to share that. I know that it seems counterintuitive, but it's, I'm I'm hoping that uh, it's a it's a it's a risk worth taking for the for the good of the patient population. Um, anything else I can tell you or? I think we're going to pause here and see if there are any questions or comments from commissioners. Yes, ma'am. Are there any questions or comments? Uh, JP, um, Commissioner Harris, uh, I know you had a question. Yeah, not of the doctor, but specifically of the assistant sheriff. I'm just wondering, you, you alluded to the fact you have um, uh, custody personnel off uh, due to COVID. Can you give me some idea um, what, what percentage of your um, custody personnel uh, are you uh, are you uh, not don't have it in service because of COVID. Um, before I answer that question, Commissioner, I just want to give Dr. Anderson even more credit than than <laughs> right now. In that two-year period that he was talking about, we've had these 17 unfortunate deaths who were COVID positive at time of death. Not all of them were COVID related or caused the death, but during that same time frame, we probably had 200,000 people come through our doors either release or intake. So when you look at the numbers of 200,000 people and that many, uh, I think the quality of care they're getting from, from Dr. Henderson and his staff, that's telling. Um, I don't think the community can actually match that. So I just wanted to, to give him that. Um, so right now today, sir, I have 287 positive employees um, and recovered is 1146 and I have 395 are quarantined as of today though. Thank you. Are there are other questions or comments from commissioners. Um, I just want to kind of highlight a couple of things that were reported to the commission by the civil brand uh, commission and get a reaction from uh, assistant uh, sheriff chase and from Dr. Henderson. So, um, according to the civil brand commission, obviously, as is the case out in the community, we've seen a significant spike. Uh, in the month of December into the month of January. Um, uh, but uh, the, com the commissioners, the civil brand commissioners have observed inconsistent protocols for quarantine, uh, deputies not wearing masks uh, consistently, which obviously is a violation of, of county policy in terms of masks indoors and obviously not best practice. Um, the quarantine module uh, protocol is being applied in inconsistently with respect to CDRF, a number of uh, women have missed court dates as a result of quarantines, as uh, Dr. Gomes mentioned. Uh, people are coming in and out of the modules, even though it's supposed to be in quarantine, and this includes LASD staff. Um, uh, and the, this also impacts pregnant women who are under quarantine who may miss court dates. So I think, as you said, the department and CHS seem to have done a good job in reducing uh, the incidence of severe illness and death, but we're also concerned about how quarantine is impacting the mental and physical health of, of folks inside, as well as its as well as the impact on their constitutional right to uh, due process um, and getting into court and potentially even getting released, right? Which would help reduce the pressure uh, in terms of the population. So I'm wondering if uh, you have any comments on the quarantine process. And how that's being um, managed um, uh, in in the jails regarding things like um, mental health um, activities, and I, I appreciate that you you mentioned, uh, Dr. Henderson, that we need to provide services um, and support to folks who are in custody. But there's also some concerns about access to um, uh, to courts um, and uh, hearings. So I'm wondering if you could respond to that. I think the assistant sheriff has been in contact with the courts more than I have, and we did work on this and came up with a strategy. So um, 
Mr. Corbett, perhaps you could summarize it better than I. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, we've been working with the courts for many months now, um, and we've been consulting with Dr. Henderson on that. So if an individual is fully vaccinated, and um, they can go to court, um, that's, you know, we're obviously following the CHS and CDC guidelines for that. Um, however, because of this latest surge, uh, I believe the courts have restricted preliminary hearings and trials uh, to protect their personnel in their courtrooms. So that we have no control over. Um, however, the court handles that is um, on their purview. We just respond to that in kind. But we have made uh, individuals that are fully vaccinated and in trial, what we'll do is they can, they can get uh, their court date and then we will actually isolate them uh, the entire time for the duration of their trial so they can't be possibly placed under a quarantine to restrict them from going to trial. Um, so anybody in trial has been identified as vaccinated, um, we do, it's not a punishment, but it's an isolation to prevent them from being quarantined. There was, a, there was occasions where individual will go to court in the morning and then their housing would be quarantined by the time they get back in the afternoon and it would cause a problem for the courts. So we've been working with the courts to get a list of the in-trials and working with the public defender and the, the district attorney to identify people in trial that we can move into an isolated area for the duration of their trial so that quarantine problem doesn't occur. Uh, and, Doctor, uh, I'm sorry, Commissioner, one other thing. We do understand that, that and I've been actually working with Dr. Henderson and Dr. Belovich and, and my staff on this is, and I mentioned earlier, the sergeants going in and educating on when somebody's quarantined or when they're not. We do understand that some of the housing areas, there was confusion. So the additional, what we're doing uh, on a technology end is we have an electric UDAL system there where the deputies have to do their checks and all that. And what we're gonna do is work with our EOC. So if an area is put under quarantine, automatically the UDAL will turn red and tell them it's a quarantined area. So there's no confusion on the deputy's part if they're under quarantine or not. So we're hoping that will resolve a lot of that. Thank you. Um, and the, the, the last thing I'll, I'll say before we take a break, um, unless there are other commissioner questions is, we understand that um, uh, uh, public health um, and other entities are looking at how COVID data is managed. Um, uh, have you heard any concerns about uh, the integrity of uh, COVID reporting? Are you concerned about its accuracy? In other words, Assistant Sheriff Chase. I mean, excuse me, Assistant Sheriff Corbett. I'm not sure I, I, I'm not, could you kind of maybe explain a little bit more what you're looking for, Commissioner? Yeah, so um, uh, the Civil Brand Commission uh, indicated that they had some concerns about the integrity of uh, COVID data, um, and they want, and they are concerned that it's not adequately or accurately reflecting um, the spread of COVID in the jails. And so I'm wondering if you've heard those concerns, and if so, uh, what's being done about data management regarding COVID cases? So I. I not sure what COVID data that would be re, uh, mentioned. Um, we, when somebody becomes positive or they test or they're asymptomatic, that data is collected and Correction Health Services has that because that's a HIPAA and that's a medical thing uh, that we would just then track how many people are like the doctor said, he treats symptomatic or asymptomatic, it's the person's positive. So I'm not sure which data set you might be talking to. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll see if uh, Dr. Grills can clarify. Unfortunately, she just logged off. Um, but uh, thank you so much, um, uh, Assistant Sheriff Corbett, for being here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Henderson, for being here for the duration of our discussion about uh, COVID uh, about conditions of confinement in um, LA County jails. Uh, we are at about uh, 11:37 now, and uh, we're due for a break. So uh, why don't we take a break till about 11:45? Because I know folks in who, who have been uh, you know monitoring our meeting all uh, day are interested in uh, commenting. So we'll take a break till 11:45, and then we'll we will hear from uh, public uh, comment. All right, 11:45. Thank you all.
And if you are a commissioner back in front of your computer, please turn your camera on. So we have about one minute left before the break. It looks like we are at 1145 right now. Again, if you're a commissioner in front of your computer, please turn your camera on so we can account for everyone. Okay, so I think we've got a uh, we've got everybody here. Uh, let's move into public comment on uh, agenda item B, which is conditions of confinement in LA County jails. We've discussed allegations of racial discrimination, the treatment of uh, pregnant uh, women, which seems not to be simply alleged. Everyone seems to agree that there are critical problems, uh, as well as the um, management of COVID-19 in the jails. Uh, so at this point, we will take public comment. I want to thank um, folks who have been tuning in and patiently waiting uh, to comment on this item. Uh, as you saw, we, have, we had a lot to discuss. Uh, so I wanna quickly give folks some instructions on how to make public comment. Uh, if you wanna provide verbal public comment to the commission, uh, whether in English or Spanish, you must log into WebEx. If you are calling via telephone or watching the Facebook live stream, you must, uh, you may not, you, you are not able to provide uh, uh, verbal comments at this time. In order to join uh, WebEx, please visit coc.lacounty.gov and click the link to register and join the meeting. When you register, you'll be able to select the agenda item you would like to comment on. And this one is item B, conditions of confinement in LA County jails. Uh, if you would like to comment and you've selected your item, you can raise your hand in the participant window or send a chat to the host to ensure you are in the queue uh, for, for public comment. Uh, when you're providing public comment, please try to minimize uh, or eliminate any background noise uh, as much as possible. Uh, today, we're gonna do about one minute uh, per person uh, just to make sure that we get to the last two agenda items regarding mental health and deputies and hospitals. Um, uh, so you don't have to yield any time because we hear from family uh, impact remarks at the top of the agenda, so there's no need to yield. Um, and if you'd like to submit a written comment uh, regarding today's uh, meeting, uh, you can do so in English or Spanish at coc.lacounty.gov. All correspondence received by 5 o'clock today will be a part of the official meeting record uh, attached to the meeting minutes. And again, please uh, make your comments in alignment with our code of conduct that I mentioned at the top of the um, uh, meeting. Okay, uh, so uh, I'll now turn to Ingrid to make the announcement in Spanish. Buenos días. Si necesita que sus comentarios sean traducidos de español a inglés, simplemente diga la palabra español antes de comenzar y alguien le dará instrucciones de cómo proceder. Gracias. Thank you. And the first comment. How many, how many people do we have signed up? We have about 10 individuals who have signed up so far. Great. Thank you. Uh, please proceed. Okay. And Marke Almseg, you are unmuted. Please go ahead with your comment. Hi. Can you hear me all right? We do. All right. Um, so I just wanted to comment that people are currently dying in LA County jails. And as we saw by the beginning of December of last month, oh, 51 people wow. died in custody. And we don't even know if that's the full number of deaths because the sheriff's department doesn't tell the public when people die on its watch. The commission very much so needs to require greater transparency from the sheriff's department on both the fact and the cause of people's death. And um, the public and oversight bodies cannot effectively address the issues leading to death in custody without knowing that people are dying and why. Um, 
the fact that COVID deaths have been reported publicly as they occur, other deaths and causes of death can be reported in the very same way while still protecting the privacy and uh, of the individual and the families that are impacted. Um, regarding the, the issues of mistreatment of pregnant persons at these facilities is truly, truly disheartening to hear. I mean, hearing that they are not willing to take accountability for their role in the mistreatment of, of, of pregnant pe people shows that the sheriff's department really should not be in control of this, that the sheriff's department- and that does conclude your time. Thank you for your comment. And next we will hear from Andres Kwan. Andres, you're unmuted, please go ahead. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we do, please go ahead. So uh, I'm just going to tell you, uh, Jalen Lovett died in October under the sheriff's custody and watch. Uh, Destiny Ortega was arrested just a month ago on suspicion of violating parole, and she died the next day, again, under the sheriff's custody and watch. As you've heard from Meraki, the jails are places of death, and under Sheriff Villanueva, there have been record-level deaths. Uh, we, we don't know to the, to the, to the, to yet how many deaths have uh, happened in 2021, but what we do know is that 2021 has been the deadliest. Um, and so we know what we need to do. We need obviously greater transparency. We sound like a broken record when we say that and independent oversight. But more importantly, we need to get people out of the jails. There, these jails are places of sickness, abuse, and death. And the COC must treat them as such and push for avenues to prevent incarceration and remove those already there. Lastly, we must hold Sheriff Villanueva accountable. It was, it's been under his watch. And we urge the COC to recommend to the board a charter amendment to the voters to strengthen the system of checks and balances on the sheriff that's currently Thank you. That. And that does conclude your time. Uh, next, we will hear from Helena de Alvera. You're unmuted. Please go ahead. My name is Helena Laub. I'm an intern with ACLU SoCal and an LA County resident. The Civil Brand Commission reports significant misconduct and mistreatment of people at CRDF, and SBC reports instances of racial bias against Black women removing them from programming, prohibiting black women from going to recreation together, banning access to books written by black authors and instances of serious retaliation for filing grievances and talking with SBC commissioners. They also further report illegal shackling of pregnant persons at CRDF, particularly during travel and at the direction of sheriffs at the hospital. Pregnant people may not be restrained this way nor may they be shackled to another person during transport. Such action puts pregnant people at serious risk because they're more prone to falling. The Sheriff's Department says that it is investigating the SBC reports. LASD cannot be trusted to complete a thorough and accurate investigation. Reports of in-custody misconduct and retaliation must be investigated by an independent body. Thank you. Thank you. And next we will hear from Christian Green. You're unmuted, please go ahead, Christian. Thank you so much. Greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Christian Green. I am the campaign coordinator for Cancel the Contract in an Antelope Valley, Lancaster, Palmdale. First and foremost, my heart goes out to Jelani Lovett and uh, their family. Um, this should never be happening. Um, second thing I want to make a comment on is in regards to how my mother was pregnant and I was born in a jail cell. And um, they actually found drugs and heroin in my system. So I was one of those crack babies. And so um, the, the need for health and wellness for uh, women in jail is definitely needed. Lastly, I'm following up about uh, the presentation that we did in October of last year um, to you all in regards to deputies in schools. Um, we have not heard back in regards to the incident regarding Michaela uh, Robinson. Um, we would love to figure out what's going on with the use of force policy. Is there any oversight? Um, is there any type of protocols that are being put into place for the use of force for students on um, on campuses and out here in the Antelope Valley, we definitely need protocols, we need procedures, we need policies in place, and we are looking to you for, to you all for help. Thank you. Thank you. And next, we will hear from Tamara K. You're unmuted. Please go ahead, Tamara. Hi. Good day. Um, power and strength to all the families impacted by a share of violence and murder and custody deaths. Um, Jelani Lovett's family, John Horton's family, Waukesha Wilson's family. Um, Excuse me. So, uh, more than 50 people died in custody in 2021. It's higher. Um, it is higher than every year going on back to at least 2013. More people died in, in the first three quarters of 2021 than all of 2020. And every year going back to at least 2013, 
Uh, Sheriff Villanueva must take responsibility for the drastic increase of in-custody deaths since he took office. Um, again, the civil brand commission reports some significant misconduct, mistreatment of our pregnant um, black, especially black and brown women, um, and uh, removing them from programming, pro prohibiting them from recreation, banging together books um, written by black authors. Um, also, the treatment of pregnant women um, being restrained with leg irons and Thank chains. Thank you, and that does conclude your time. Next, we will hear from Michelle Infante. You're unmuted. Please go ahead, Michelle. Thank you. LASD uses the pandemic as an excuse for the poor medical treatment and unethical and immoral practices from their deputies. Uh, three doctors come on, and every one of them, they say people are 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 lost, and, and instead of saying that they have died while in custody, um, while under the care of LASD, the reason why people are dying because of lack of medical care and deputy gangs who are killing black and brown people every single month. The brown water, it's okay to drink brown water that's full of maggots. We have three doctors that come on here and say that that's okay. And we give bottles of water, a limited amount to women who are pregnant. What in the world are these people thinking when they come on here that we are listening to what they're talking about? It's absurd to sit here and listen to people that are caring for thousands of people inside concrete slave ships and that have a voice and that aren't using it. It's pathetic. It's terrible. It's appalling. Thank you. And that does conclude your time. Next, we will hear from Raquel Derfler. You're unmuted. Please go ahead, Raquel. Hear me? We do. Okay, so sorry. Um, I'm also with Cancel the Contract. I'm one of the steering committees. I'm here today with Christian Green. Um, I would like to address the issue of deputies in schools. Um, school resource officers are covered by the 2015 settlement agreement that um, LASD has with the DOJ. I personally met with the Lancaster Station um, captain to discuss the incident that happened at the Lancaster High School. He was both dismissive and arrogant. Uh, two comments really stood out. First, he wouldn't answer some of my questions, not because he was legally prohibited from doing so, but because he didn't want to. And secondly, he said the reason that the settlement uh, agreement was ongoing was because the DOJ was bowing to political pressure. So we are asking for you um, as a commission to hold hearings on why the settlement agreement is still not in compliance. We need your help out here. Our brown and black communities are suffering. Um, they are afraid of the police. Thank you. Thank I you. Wanna, I just want to note for, for those folks who are interested in commenting on the uh, issue related to um, deputy presence in schools in the Antelope Valley, we, we will be we will be getting a brief update uh, on that. And so you can also, uh, I would encourage you to, to reserve your comments for, for that time on the uh, agenda, which will sort of be general public comment. Um, uh, we can go to our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you. And we do have two more speakers. Pastor Q, Jean-Marie, you are unmuted. Uh, next, we will have a call-in user, and those are the only people who have signed up for public comments that I've seen so far. So, Pastor Q, please go ahead. Yes, uh, I don't know what we're going to do with uh, without you, Commissioner O'Shan. Congratulations. Um, it's been a pleasure working with you. As it relates to everything we've heard today, I'm not surprised. We've been here from the very beginning. A flawed system will continue and will always give you these outcomes. It doesn't matter if you put people of color in that system. The system was set up by biased people, and so the outcomes are going to be biased. Watered, the treatment of pregnant women, disproportionate number of the black women in jail, in custody death, family harassment by deputy gangs, unconstitutional medical care. We popcorn from issue to issue like we've been been doing for years because the system is flawed. The sheriff does whatever he wants. That's what Susan Burton says, and that's where I'm going to leave it. Blessings. Thank you. And the last speaker is an anonymous call-in user. You are unmuted. You have one minute. Please go ahead. Um, I yield my time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And Chair Ochin, that does conclude public comment on LA County Jails. Uh, thank you all for your comments um, and lifting up issues that uh, were sort of hinted at during our conversation, but not fully addressed. We are mindful um, that the number of suicides in our jails are up uh, significantly, and that is certainly the responsibility of LA County and the Sheriff's Department. 
I'm sure that the the crisis of mental health, like many, you know, those of us on the on the outside are experiencing a crisis of mental health. I can only imagine what that's like for people who are inside, away from their family, away from their communities, and in quarantine uh, for indefinite periods and without clear rationale. Um, how that might impact people with uh, mental illness uh, who are disproportionately in our jails. Um, so these are critical questions that we are certainly going to, to take up, um, or the commission will take up um, in the coming months. Uh, we have two additional items that I think are somewhat connected, so I want to take them together. Uh, we have uh, Los Angeles County Mental Health Crisis Response Alternatives and deputy, deputies in county health facilities. I think these are, again, similar issues and are connected. So I'd like to um, call our speakers together and it will also economize our time. Um, if there are there any objections to us doing that? Okay, uh, so uh, I think Miriam Brown is here uh, to talk about um, a mental health crisis response. Uh, she is the deputy director of emergency out of the emergency outreach bureau for the Department of Mental Health. We will also hear from uh, speakers about uh, deputies in uh, LA County health facilities. In particular, we'll hear from uh, Azar Katan, who is the chief operations officer of the Department of uh, Health Services, uh, as well as Sunita Patel, who is an assistant professor of law. Uh, UCLA and the founding uh, faculty director of the UCLA uh, Veteran uh, Legal Clinic. Uh, so uh, we will start with the mental health response teams uh, and uh, Ms. Brown. Ms. Brown, thank you for being here. Yes, good morning, everyone. And I think I have a pleasure to be most, to have known most of you met with you in the past. My name is Miriam Brown. I'm the deputy director for the Department of Mental Health Emergency Outreach and Triage Division. And what it means is I oversee the psychiatric mobile response team, the law enforcement teams, our school threat assessment response team, and the crisis response uh, within LA County for mental health issues. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, today, I'm gonna uh, talk to you a little bit about what we're doing in LA County uh, with, um, we're going to be talking more about mobile response, uh, mobile crisis response teams, which includes both the civilian teams and the mental evaluation team. I was also asked to talk a little bit about the call center, which is that 988, which is the mental health line. Um, and what are the you know plans? Because it's not about just placing someone on a hold or uh, assessing and sending for further evaluation, but our plans to add facilities uh, for crisis services where people can go for services. Next. And here's a little bit of the timeline and the background. Um, uh, that department and the state received uh, what's called the National Standard for Crisis Calls. And as you know, there's a lot that has been going on over the past uh, couple of years. Uh, we continue to respond uh, to calls, but um, for example, um, in 2020, we learned about, um, through the Board of Supervisors, there was a board motion about partnership between DMH and the CEO and alternative to crisis to incarcerations. October 2020, there was a bill, a federal bill that established that the 9NA national number for behavioral crisis calls to go live in July 2022. Uh, we began to work in 2022, it seems so far, but now we're here because for me, July uh, 22 is around the corner. So we have been working very diligent uh, in a solicitation process to find out who will be the best uh, uh, person to handle that line. And that line will be 24-7. Uh, people will be calling. Uh, I'm sure that for a little bit of time, uh, they're still going to call 911, but we're working very closely with our law enforcement stakeholders and with stakeholders in the community to ensure that if a call goes to 911, but it's really about mental health, how do they divert the call to that 988? And really, they came up with 988 as an easier number. Right now, we have a number 1-800-854-7771, which is long. But the goal is to have the 988 very similar to 911, but it's all related to mental health. May 2021, um, the department engaged and uh, with a consulting firm, which is RI International, 
that consulting firm has really working with everyone. There's been a lot of meetings. I'm sure you guys have attended some of those public meetings regarding public, um, the public meetings regarding crisis uh, expansion. So what does that mean? It really means that uh, we are going through a really, really transition in terms of working with the community, here with the community, uh, and having not only clinicians respond to calls, but also our community health workers or peers that have lived experience either of their own or through their family members. So the national standards call for three things to be really reimagined, reevaluated, which is people should have a place to call. It shouldn't be that difficult. So a place to call will be the 988 where there will be mental health professionals they will be able to speak with the person and really make the determination. Does, does he or she needs an appointment within 24 hours, within 48, 72, and they will be able to connect and set up an appointment for the person? Or do they need a mobile crisis response team, which will be composed of two civilians? Or do we need to call 911 because there's a medical issue? Or do we need to call 911 for patrol because there's some critical, critical, critical call where it requires immediate assistance? And then patrol will make the decision on how do they, when do they uh, decide to call our mental evaluation teams? Um, so it, it's all in the works. Uh, it's been a lot of work trying to get the right technology, the proper levels of communication, so they'll be all be in real time. We will be connected and we'll know how to, where the teams are. Uh, someone to respond, it's it's really means either the psychiatric mobile response team, which is none today, in the future will be the mobile crisis outreach team, or you know, our law enforcement teams, which means the mental evaluation teams, the SMART or the teams with other police departments. So, so far, we really have gotten input from the communities from all levels uh, in order to make the determinations, how do we do this and how do we go 24-7? Because that's the other piece uh, to provide 24-7 services. Right now, we don't have a 24-7 uh, operations uh, for our mobile crisis response teams. We function uh, during the day until uh, 2 o'clock, three o'clock in the morning, depending when the call comes in. But the goal is to have teams 24 uh, seven, either mobile crisis response teams or law enforcement teams or med teams or smart teams. They all function until the 30 in the morning. Next slide, please. What do we have? Our current system, uh, what we have is about 36 psychiatric mobile response team countywide during the daytime. And uh, during the after hours or at night, we do provide uh, services, but it, we really rely on staff who's willing to work overtime. We don't have designated staff within PMRT to say, okay, you work from two, from four to two o'clock in the morning. We rely on staff who's willing to provide these services, which we have been very fortunate to have staff that is willing to work after hours, weekends, and holidays. But it's not, again, it's not 24 seven. And sometimes, you know, it all depends on the holidays, uh, but we'll hope that once we expand these themes, uh, we'll go 24 seven. We have about 120 law enforcement teams countywide, of which 33 are budgeted through the county by, uh, through LSD, which is a sheriff's department with mental evaluation teams. This is our current system. Uh, if you ask me today, that's what we have, and that's where we're working. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, what is the future expansion? I know the primary uh, focus uh, for this group, it's the mental evaluation teams with the Sheriff's Department. Uh, we have 33 teams, as I mentioned to you, uh, for field work. Uh, we also have one that it's a, a collaborative with the city of West Hollywood, which means we have 34. And we have our triage desk, um, those the clinicians and the officers who answers the phones, and you know the team that provides ongoing case management. Currently, we're working on matching the six items for the veterans mental evaluation team, and have requested additional items during the budget request 
because uh, I know for I think it's gonna, we're going to be in six years. Um, five about six years ago, we began the expansion countywide. Uh, the goal is to really expand on faces, so we began on faces, hoping that one day we could go to 45, and then one day to go to 60 teams. Of course, COVID really, you know, put you know, really change uh, our plans because our plans were, were to gradually increase. Um, but our goal is to continue to work with um, with our partners with LASD, increase the teams. Uh, but for the immediate future, we're looking at the six teams, um, the supervisor and five clinicians, and also for additional uh, with the budget request. With PMRT or what the future, it's going to be mobile crisis, uh, mobile crisis outreach teams. Uh, we are working with our providers. We're going to have teams not only managed by DMH, but we also have, you know, work with the providers to also have uh, them teams at different hours of the day. So together we can provide better services to the community. Additionally, we have looked into all the other aspects, not only about teams, uh, not only about peers, but also equity. Uh, what are the what what are the areas that are high need? Uh, we look at RD, which is um, you know equity, looking at the community, what services the community needs, uh, looking at having a cultural competent uh, staff on board. Uh, you know, gender, language, ethnicity, all of these factors that are really critical uh, to serve our communities. Got it. So, okay. Ms. Brown, I want to pause here uh, because we are coming up on uh, our, the end of our, our time for our, our meeting, and I want to make sure to get to all of our speakers. Um, this is my last uh, slide. Ah, okay, great. Um, so, we'll, thank you very much. So, so we have, we're perfect, uh, perfectly mm -hmm. in sync here. Um, uh, so, I want to take just a couple of commissioner questions on the mental health uh, alternative response issue, and then we will uh, call upon our next two speakers regarding an update on uh, another issue regarding crisis response and health, uh, which is the presence of sheriff's deputies in uh, hospitals. Uh, so, are there questions uh, from the commission? Uh, Commissioner Giggins. You're muted, Commissioner Giggins. Not a question, but I appreciate Miriam Brown being here and uh, and once again um, elucidating uh, these plans. I mean, um, it's kind of exciting to see that both Department of Mental Health and LASD are out in the community and looking at working with some of the alternatives and for crisis response, and that we may very well at some point in our in our county sooner than later have more of a menu of response so we're not uh, relying on uh, heavy duty law enforcement response but more of a combination community and law enforcement when you need it um, the ad hoc committee uh, met recently um, where um, again Miriam Brown and, and LSD both talked about how they're they are talking with commun different community groups and community members to figure out how can all of this be knitted together and it's going to be a lot of experimentation but i think we all will welcome some of this experimentation that's that's going to happen and uh and i just did want to mention that um we are still committed the, the ad hoc as dmh and lesd to increasing the met we we're far from our 60 we're only at i think 34 now if we could get to the 45 that we uh recommended in our last memo to the Board of Supervisors. I think that would go, uh, 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 that would continue to ensure that when MET responds, when a full MET team responds, it is really much more in a more health oriented and not a critical incident um, outcome. Thank you, Commissioner Giggins. Any other questions or comments? Uh, so I might just Briefly, please. I just want to correct something. We originally requested, and it was approved for 60 uh, MET teams. Ultimately, it was agreed that they were going to try and do this incrementally. So 45 was the next benchmark we were hoping to meet. But I just don't want people to think we think 45 is enough. It's not. 60 is what we what we need. 
And these MET units are a co-response model. These are not uniformed deputy sheriffs. They do not respond in marked uh, black and white radio cars. Their purpose is to go there and try and deal with these people as patients and also to interact effectively with whatever law enforcement may already be on scene to ensure that these patients are treated uh, in a, in a patient-like manner as opposed to any type of criminal activity. So I just want to make that clear. Thank you. So, so we know that this is a critical issue. Um, if you look at the statistics nationally as well as locally in terms of people who um, are shot and or killed by law enforcement, um, often uh, it's precipitated by a mental health crisis. Uh, and so obviously there needs to be a reimagining of how we respond. The commission has been deeply engaged on this issue, particularly with the leadership of uh, folks like Commissioner Giggins and Commissioner Kennedy and Commissioner Harris. Um, you know, my thinking is that this should be transferred entirely to the Department of Mental Health in terms of rapid response teams. And so I think it's very heartening that uh, the county is investing in alternative uh, um, line, hotlines for people to call and uh, scaling up um, the PMRT teams um, who can be the rapid response and to triage and assess what the needs are and to call in additional resources. And so I hope that we'll get another update. Um, on uh, how this implementation process is going uh, through next year. Uh, and I imagine that there may also be additional state legislation, things like the Crises Act, and additional models like uh, San Francisco that has a non-law enforcement um, uh, crisis response uh, department. Um, so we uh, place this on the agenda, not necessarily to take action, although our staff has recommended additional steps uh, in their staff memorandum that's that's attached to the, to the agenda. Um, but we wanted to make sure that the public uh, got an update um, uh, about uh, our efforts on this issue um, and to indicate that we're uh, continuing to uh, advocate for additional support for the, one of the most vulnerable populations in our community, which is folks with uh, mental health um, uh, conditions. Okay, uh, so we're going to shift gears here from patrol and mental health to um, specialized units of the Sheriff's Department uh, in uh, health facilities. Uh, so, you know, folks are, are picked up, for example. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Brown, for being here. Um, uh, folks who, who, who are hospitalized or who may be transferred to hospital facilities um, often encounter law enforcement, particularly Los Angeles Sheriff's Department, which is contracted to uh, provide security. As we know, there was a, a, a shooting at a hospital by a sheriff's deputy uh, that I don't know, I don't think they were a part of the uh, detail that was attached to the hospital, but they were present um, and, and um, responded to an incident uh, using deadly force, uh, shooting uh, a patient, uh, which obviously is, uh, uh, you know, the last thing that you want to happen at a hospital. And so we have two folks here to talk with us about the um, what is happening and then also what what might be some additional threads that we can pursue questions that we should be asking about law enforcement presence in care facilities. So we're going to start with um, uh, we're going to start with uh, Azar Katan, who is the and I apologies if I mispronounce your name, uh, the chief operations officer of the Department of Public uh, Department of Health Services. And we'll also hear from uh, an expert, uh, Sunita Patel, who is with UCLA and the UCLA uh, Veterans uh, Clinic. So, um, uh, Ms. Katan, I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk with us about sort of what has happened since uh, the shooting at, um, uh, I think it was at Harbor. Um, uh, what's happened since then? What steps have been taken by uh, the county to ensure that uh, no such incidents ever occur again, if possible? Um, and, and what's the thinking about uh, the pres uh, about the continued uh, presence of sheriff's deputies um, at county health facilities? So I just want to clarify, I'm the CEO at Harbor UCLA Medical Center. I'm not the oh, CEO of DHSY. Excuse me, sorry. Um, I, I have been involved in the DHSY discussions, but I just wanted to clarify the expectations a little lower. Um, so, yeah, so we did have the unfortunate shooting um, by a sheriff deputy. The sheriff deputy had nothing to do with our operation. Um, the deputy in question was guarding another deputy who happened to have been admitted to the hospital for another injury and just happened to be two doors down from the, this patient. Um, we have, you know, a fairly robust and mature 
behavioral response process within the hospital. It's called the Code Gold, and I think uh, I, I saw y'all's report, um, and so I, I think you, you have, have a copy of that. But um, we have a, it's a behavioral response team um, that when a patient uh, displays agitation or aggressive behavior, we activate a clinical response team. Um, Part of that clinical response team are unarmed security guards, contract security guards who are trained to help in the behavioral response. The sheriff is not part of that response. Um, 20 years ago, they used to be. They are no longer. Um, they are adjacent to the area um, in the event, because oftentimes these do turn into um, uh, criminal acts by the individuals who are expressing agitated behavior, particularly like in the emergency room, the psychiatric emergency room, they might um, punch someone or break equipment or something like that. So sheriff is involved. We have a very clear process that is embedded by the federal government and the CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicare Services, who oversee our um, regulate us, accredit us. Um, that that you know, if it becomes a criminal incident, we have a process to hand off to law enforcement. They manage the law, the law enforcement matter and then they hand back to us. It's all very well documented. We do debriefings after every one of these behavior response teams. So we, um, in the situation that occurred, um, you know, the behavior response team was called. Unfortunately, the deputy was engaged and involved and in, um, shot the patient before the response team got there. They got there and I believe it was two minutes. So it wasn't as if it was a 20 minute wait for them to arrive. They come within, you know, two to three minutes. Um, they just come down the elevator and go to whatever unit is. So that's the internal inside the hospital response. Um, you know, we have reviewed, uh, so after the shooting, um, the CEO at, at Harbor established um, a task force of, of um, representatives from across the hospital, community members, patients to talk about the role of law enforcement, the presence of law enforcement, um, and, you know, how do we address what happened and, and improve our processes, whether it's specific to the law enforcement processes, but also to the general management of this population, right? We can always improve, um, how we deliver care. We have a very large, um, probably disproportionate to many hospitals, uh, patient population with mental health issues. And um, those patients, uh, you know, our psych units, our inpatient psych units are always full. Our psychiatric emergency rooms are very full. We are the, the three DHS hospitals, Harbor, all of you, and LACC are the destination point for all, pretty much the vast majority of law enforcement bringing in patients who they put on a, on a 5150 hold. Um, they tend to come to our hospitals because we are, when I say our book of business tends to be trauma and psychiatry, and it really is very true. We are kind of the center of excellence for this population, I think, in terms of, of bringing, bringing people in in crisis. And so, um, um, so we, we have a lot of patients in our, in our organization, whether they're here for mental health treatment or whether they're here for medical treatment. Um, one of the big challenges, and in this case, the patient was a medical patient who had a behavioral health issue. Um, and so we, you know, been talking a lot, and we, before this ever happened, have had a lot of discussions about, you know, how do you manage a mental health patient in the medical environment? It's not the same kind of physical plant environment as a psychiatric unit, right? In the psychiatric unit, it's a locked unit. Um, it is, um, it's, it's got a lot of protections in the area to make it anti-ligature free. It has a lot of things removed from the area that could be used as, um, as for lack of a better word, weapons. Um, in the event of, you know, someone having agitation. So, for example, the chairs are all kind of rubber chairs and aren't more than a certain weight because you don't want someone, you know, during a, a, a behavioral response incident, picking up a chair and throwing it at people. So, you know, the medical, the psychiatric unit is designed to be protective both to the patients and the staff. The medical units, by nature of what they do, are not. And so we've had a lot of discussions about managing this population in general, and we've discussed this system-wide as well. I mean, I, I can speak just to the caveat most directly about what we've done at Harbor, um, but I also know that these are DHS-wide conversations. Um, the, so, so as a system, DHS has been looking at what does our overall security program look like? Um, is it the, 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 we have two kind of security roles. We have the role that the sheriff provides, which is kind of the more law and order part of the protect and serve part. Um, they patrol the campuses, they, um, they, um, our, our formal security, they do all our, our, our security assessments. Um, I think that there is an important role for them to play. We have polled staff, we have polled patients, um, and, and generally the responses that we get are that people like having that kind of presence on the campus. 
I think the presence can be, as we've been discussing a lot, how does it look? Does it look like it's always looked? Can, are, there, are there variations on that theme and the role that they play? Um, I am very interested here, and we've been um, working, uh, talking with some folks at DMH and others about, and about creating more of a, uh, not inside the hospital. I think in the hospital we have a really good process in dealing with behavioral health issues because we do have the, the behavioral response team, the code gold response. But mm -hmm. if something occurs outside the hospital building, um, for example, um, a couple of years ago, there was a woman who tried to set herself and some bushes a fire next to an, a, a building outside the hospital. Um, we didn't have a real, we don't, we don't have PMRTs on the campus. Um, Matt doesn't really respond to our campuses because we have psychiatry on our campuses. It's a little bit of a catch-22 for us. Um, and so the sheriff responded. We do, actually, I will say, we do have specially trained sheriff personnel on our campus who are mental health responders. So we always have a lead deputy who is a mental health deputy, for lack of a better term, who is um, the lead for, for, for our sheriff's substation or whatever it's called on our campus. Um, and so, so the sheriff responded to it, but it was a very different response than if a PMRT had responded or a code team had responded. And so I've been really trying to figure out how do we kind of balance that, making sure we have the law enforcement that is appropriate and necessary while also having um, a mental health response first, first and then law enforcement. My understanding of the MET, MET team is it's law enforcement and then they call the mental health to support them. We're more interested in kind of the, the mental health response first and then call law enforcement if you need I think, that. I think we're in alignment there. Um, yeah. I, I want to, um, of course, give you more time to, to, to develop what your comments, but I also want to make sure we get to our uh, next speaker in uh, commissioner comments. Um, so one, one, I'm going to ask uh, commissioner that they can hold their comments until after um, uh, Professor Patel's uh, presentation. Uh, so Professor Patel, uh, you study um, policing in, in care spaces and um, I ask you to come today to kind of uh, help the commission think through some uh, questions um, uh, that we should be considering as we, um, you know, make recommendations, uh, investigate uh, incidents like the one that occurred at Harbor, uh, and the broader question about the Sheriff's Department's role in a mental or physical health crisis response. Uh, so we are grateful for your time. Thank you for being here, uh, and I'll turn it over to you, Professor Patel. Thank you, Chair Chen and the Commission for inviting me to speak about the presence of sheriff deputies in the hospitals, which you know, they serve a critical um, safety net function in our community. So my research areas include the intersection of health access and policing, and I have two articles coming out about what I'm calling a healthcare policing web because it, we re, it's very understudied the role of police and law enforcement in healthcare spaces. Um, and one of my roles at, U, at UCLA is to serve as the faculty director of a veterans legal clinic, which gives me a lot of insight into police regulation of poor people in managed care settings. Um, and the VA is considered a model in addressing behavioral health patients along with places like UCLA. So my limited time, I'm just going to make three points. And if there's time or in the Q&A, I can offer some suggestions for further study. So first, let me summarize some of the harms, um, the harm-based concerns from patients, from the public, um, and in this context based on my research and my clients' experiences. Uh, so privacy rights is a big one. The presence of law enforcement allows them to hear and observe behavior that may lead to criminal consequences. And this can, and, and you know, this um, can lead persons to avoid critical emergency care, which we obviously don't want to do, especially at this time during COVID. Um, and another concern is the potential dignity stripping aspects of having heavy police surveillance within public institutions. The presence of armed police can be triggering for patients with previous negative experiences with police. So in this way, um, you know, some of the recommendations from DHS that came out of um, the, the, the report that they provided to the, the commission could probably more robustly address racial equity in the safety framework. Um, and to what extent racial bias, unconscious or implicit bias, plays a role in how care providers are interpreting the behavior or statements of patients, especially black patients or those with complex mental illness. So research in the medical literature especially confirms bias in medical treatment that affects access to care and inequity, inequality in, um, in actually in health outcomes. 
And the commission should also be concerned about the potential for harm and intimidation from law enforcement when engaging with the public. One of the exhibits that was submitted um, by the sheriff's department mentions um, a number of complaints against the deputies that were at, that have been in uh, DHS hospitals. And there was a complaint specifically on a sheriff de deputy that had touched a woman's breast and thighs. Um, you know, it would be worth finding out how that investigation was followed up on. You know. What it what actually happened, um, et cetera. We don't have any of that information um, available to the commission right now that I know of. So let me turn to the second concern, which um, you know the other speaker also addressed, which is the manner in which the county chooses to address the risk and actual instances of workplace harm. Occupational safety laws require healthcare administrators to address what we call potential hazards of workplace violence in the health setting. And this is a very serious concern, um, but they have choices around how to address the issue of workplace violence or harm in healthcare. So my research that's mainly been in the federal context shows that um, these laws around hazard and safety issues in the health space arose at the same time as uh, po we were popularizing, or police were popularizing order maintenance and broken window style policing. So in the 90s and the 80s, 1990s and the 1980s, the legal requirements developed around um, occupational safety and health uh, in this space. And, you know, security and maintaining security naturally turned to policing because of this overarching framework that was, um, Kind of, uh, you know, in vogue at the time, um, and it's obviously been been roundly criticized at this point. Um, and so, but at the time, nurse and and I think it's really important to recognize that although uh, the surveys may indicate that health workers would like the presence of security and police, that at the time when these laws were developed, nurses unions and medical administrators really questioned the utility of bringing armed personnel into the health spaces. And they many preferred social work or clinical care workers to, to play those functions. Um, and I guess I say it's not too late for institutions like hospitals to that have been become acculturated towards turning to police for security to experiment with alternatives. And I'm really happy to see that DHS is um, exploring those at this time. And then there's some underappreciated elements in the medical and occupational safety literature uh, that I wanted to point out. And one is stress of law enforcement and weapons in the work environment. There's actually been studies to show that the increased presence of, of those elements can bring some um, additional harm to workers. And then my last point is really that police and security presence in county hospitals is quite large and criminal and health law scholars are all re suggesting reducing the reliance on police. And I'm glad that we're all on the same page in that regard. Um, and the report we have been given shows that there are over 400 unarmed contracted security personnel and 135 sheriff's deputy personnel servicing DHS hospitals and facilities. Um, with over 36 million going to the sheriff's department. That's quite a large amount. Um, and we know in addition to that, there are many pathways for police to enter the emergency rooms. And in fact, we just heard that um, it was a, a different law enforcement detail that was there that led to you know, the, the, the tragic death of Mr. Burroughs. Um, and my colleague at UC Irvine, um, Ji Sun Song, she's been writing about the ways police use emergency rooms to extend their search authority and we heard you know we've heard testimony about that or the commission heard testimony about that in the in june and this really bumps up against hipaa and constitutional protections for patients um and it's important to limit those pathways and to really help staff to feel that they can stand up to the pressure of assisting interrogate in interrogations and searching of um persons and property in the hospital space. Um, and so I, 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 you know, I really support the recommendation of a pilot for the psychiatric mobile response team at the Harbor. I think that's a great idea and there are more ways to experiment. So I'll end there. Um, I have some suggestions for further study based on some of the documents that were given to the commission. I'm happy to talk about that at, uh, offline or later. Just conclude by pointing out something that seems really obvious is that we have to come up with solutions to address workplace safety, but also the safety of patients and uh, more sworn police officers uh, may not be the way to go. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>
So we still have a, a um, public comment. And of course, we want to take questions from commissioners. So I just want to be mindful of time and I want to resolve the issue about the chair election. So, um, uh, are there questions for our panelists from the commission? Uh, uh, so, I just have 1 quick question uh, for is it uh, Dr. Kazan uh, Katan or is it. Uh, Kazar, Kazar, excuse me. Um, so, I, I want to ask about some of the policies that um, are in place in terms of your memorandum uh, memoranda with uh, LASD, as well as your internal policies in reading the underlying policies that were provided to the commission. It seems as though. Uh, the hospital defers to LASD in terms of their training um, and policies regarding use of force. Um, have you is is if is that true? Uh, and if it is, have you considered modifying that that standard and coming up with best practices in a, uh, a healthcare setting in terms of how police engage with with patients? I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Um, so, in other words, the question is, um, you know, I mean, no. do you all come up with standards for how LASD personnel will engage with your patients or your staff in terms of uses of force? Um, or do you defer to the sheriff's department to develop their own policies and practices? So, they're required to follow all of our policies. So, for example, in this instance, the policy would have been to follow the behavioral response process. They didn't. Um, th there is a bit of a, um, I don't know, disconnect from the right word. Um, the, the sheriff personnel who are assigned to our hospital are um, oriented into the hospital's policies. They're here theoretically every day. This is their primary assignment, and they're aware of the environment in which they're in. The dichotomy is when we have the outside law enforcement come in. And in this case, it was an outside law enforcement who did not know anything about our facility. Um, and the ones who come into the ED when they're bringing in a patient for you know, clearance to book or for whatever reason um, are not necessarily familiar with our, our facility. So one of the things that we have done is we reviewed our process and policy regarding the presence of outside law enforcement on the campus. We put into place a bunch of um, backstops where they need to check in with the security guards when they come to the ED. And we kind of got it tiered depending on where they're going and how long they're here. Um, but they need to check in with the guard. There is an orientation pamphlet. And, and even and if they're, they're coming for a short period of time, the orientation, we have key orientation information is right there where they sign in. Um, so they know the key things like, you know, don't intervene in the behavioral response. Don't, you know, this, the care, clinical care is driven by the staff and that's preeminent, preeminent, and we go to you for assistance. You don't intervene first. And that's our general policy. That's spelled out in that. Um, they have to have a badge because one of the problems that I think our staff had with this, in this case was the sheriff deputies all wear the same uniform, whether it's a harbor deputy or some other deputy. And, and because they do a lot of overtime because the sheriff is not as well staffed as they apparently would like to be, you know, they, they may not know that you're, you know, are the one assigned here. So we now have all outside law enforcement need to wear a visitor sticker, a law enforcement visitor sticker, so that makes them visible. Um, anyone who's here for a long detail needs to check in through the sheriff. They log them in. Um, they are actually given a brochure. The sheriff rounds on, our sheriff rounds on them. They are a connecting point between them. We have a backstop if, if, because oftentimes if they're with a patient, they just go straight up. If someone goes straight up and the nursing staff sees a law enforcement officer that they're not aware of or didn't know was supposed to be there, they will then call sheriff and sheriff will come up. So we try to put in backstops so that we're aware of who's in our building because it really, I think, is more of the issue of the the the, the non-harbor law enforcement um, who really don't know about the organization. Got it. And, in, and in this case, the sheriff's deputy that was not a part of the assigned unit, did he get such an orientation or information about um, their what they are able to do in the facility? No, because uh, we th this was a we had a, a vaguer process. We kind of tightened up the process as a result of this incident. So the, this new process was kind of multiple backstops. It was much more informal. When they checked in, they got a brochure, and then they went upstairs. But there really weren't kind of backstops to make sure that we knew who was who was here and where they were. So now, if someone comes in and they're with a patient on three E, they have to sign in, and we know who the patient is, where they are. They they always had signed in with the sheriff. 
but they didn't necessarily come through us and we didn't touch them or weren't quite as aware. So it's kind of, hopefully, it seems to be, um, you know, because we, we, we have to track the documentation for you collect the data and it seems to be working fairly well that, that they are touching someone, whether it's one of our staff, whether it's sheriff, whether it's one of the contract security guards, to get that information. Um, and, and, and at least we're giving them the information, how much, you know, I <laughs> Got can't, it. can't speak on how well people pay attention, but at least we're trying on our end. And, and our, our sheriff folks, um, our sergeant has been really helpful in terms of reaching out to other law enforcement agencies um, mm -hmm. to make sure that they're aware of this is our rule now, right? Like, so it wasn't yeah. just we just sprung it, but we really tried to use the relationships that our sheriff, the Harbor Sheriff folks have with the community to be able to reach out to those kind of more frequent visiting law enforcement entities to yeah. say, you know, hey, these are our processes, you need to follow them now. Thank so. you, thank you. Uh, are there additional questions from commissioners? Okay, uh, so we have um, uh, public comment on this issue. Uh, Jennifer, how many people are signed up? There are currently nine individuals signed up. Okay, um, because we are running so short on time, and I, I apologize, we, we, we have to take just five minutes for, for public comment to accommodate these folks because um, uh, Commissioner uh, Kennedy has to log off at 1250 and we want to resolve what we're doing with the uh, election. So we will take public comment um, uh, until uh, 1245, which means we have about 30 seconds. Apologies for, for, for this item. Uh, so, uh, Jennifer, um, please, uh, excuse me, Ingrid, please uh, make the announcement in Spanish, and we will hear from the, uh, the nine folks who would like to make a comment. Buenas tardes. Si necesita traducción de sus comentarios de inglés, uh, español a inglés, simplemente diga la palabra español antes de comenzar, y alguien le dirá cómo proceder. Gracias. Thank you. And the first comment will come from Cristina Vazquez. You're unmuted. Please go ahead, Cristina. Hi, I'm the wife of Marco Vasquez Jr. who was killed during a mental health crisis in his home in front of his family. And I just wanted to comment that I don't believe that law enforcement should be involved whatsoever when it comes to a mental health crisis. Um, I witnessed them just murder him. If they're trained to kill, there's no way to untrain that mentality. And I feel that they would be showing up at every incident that way. Um, I also hold DHS just as responsible because the clinician who showed up lacked so much empathy and I feel like she would have been holding the gun as well. Thank you. Thank you. And next we will hear from Charity Robinson. You're unmuted. Please go ahead, Charity. Charity Robinson, you're unmuted. Would you like to make a comment? Mm -hmm. Charity? I heard her for a second, but uh, we will move on to Marakai. Al Meng said, you're unmuted. Please go ahead. Okay, my name is Meraki. Um, the, this commission needs to do far more than just the staff report's recommendations to protect people from the sheriff's history of violence. It needs to support, actively support, shifting mental health, um, mental health rapid response to community-based solutions. Community organizations have already um, have already been doing this work. Mental health workers have already been doing this work. They need the support of this commission. They need the funds that the LA Sheriff's Department has in order to properly serve our community members. Okay, LA and just conclude your time. Next, we will hear from Mel Bailey. You're unmuted. Please go ahead, Mel. Hi. Um, good morning. Thank you for the recognition. I just, just real quick, I serve on my board of directors, HLA in the South Bay area. Um, we had a resident who was suffering from mental health issues and we reached out to LASD for assistance. It never took place. Um, a lot of things are transpiring and we just really need some kind of understanding as to who to reach out to in those times because we're told to reach out to them. We go to community meetings, but nothing ever happened. So, if someone on here can identify, who do we Not reach out with? Your time. On that point, if staff can follow up with him to figure out what uh, precisely is happening to see if we can um, provide some support. Got it. We will reach out, Mel. Uh, and the next comment Thank will you. come from Tamara K. Please go ahead, Tamara. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. 
power and strength to the Vasquez and the Borges family. We need law, all law enforcement out of hospitals and out of mental health services. The community voted on Measure J. We need our money to go in to holistic, holistic care for mental health. We need to change the way we look at mental health and treat our patients. They should not be criminalized. They should not be murdered. We need our funds and our resources to go into mental health workers, not yeah. law enforcement. Yeah. Conclude your time. Thank you. And next we will hear from Virginia McGowan. You're unmuted. Please go ahead, Virginia. Yes. Can you hear me? We do. Yes. My daughter was arrested. No rights were read to her. She's mental health and they kept her in the jail. They brought her to the hospital. They told her that she was mental health. The officer said he didn't believe it. The watch commander didn't believe it. I'm paying thousands of dollars for lawyers and they never read us rights. They never told us anything. They said, that's the way they do in Lancaster. They just jump you like George Floyd. That's the way they do in Lancaster. So something needs to be done in Lancaster and all over. Because that's not the right way to do it, especially a mental health person. And I'm not mental. They did it yeah. right in front of me. Thank they you. Didn't that your right time. At all. And next we will hear from Julie Martinez. Please Who go ahead, that? Julie. Hi, hello. Can you hear me? We do, please go ahead. Okay, thank you for this opportunity. I am an impacted family. My grandson was murdered at a routine traffic stop. Alley County sheriffs are incapable of even communicating with the community on a very basic level. They really have no business in aiding and any type of uh, service with mental health. They are very, very dangerous and we need to reimagine and figure out a way to end all contracts and end any program. Yeah, Thank you. That does conclude your time. And the last speaker is an anonymous call-in user. You are unmuted. Please go ahead with your comment. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is David Dantzler. And just real quick, I think a lot of it comes down to the level of education. I don't mean any disrespect to the sheriffs, but, you know, there's a level of education that's associated with how you treat people. Even probation officers have to have a degree. And I think that that's something that's very, um, like the lady said earlier about Measure J, there should be people who are highly trained in this area, not just regularly trained. And um, in the interest of time, that's all I have. Thank you. And Chair Ochin, that does conclude everyone who has signed up for public comment on these items. Thank you, everyone who provided comment, uh, and thank you for your understanding uh, around how we're managing um, our time here. Uh, as I mentioned, um, Commissioner Kennedy has to uh, log off, and I wanted to sort of uh, outline what uh, I think we can do to proceed here, given that we are short one commissioner and are going to lose another. Um, uh, Commissioner Kennedy has agreed to step into the chair role uh, until our next meeting. Uh, he does not wish to be chair, however. Uh, so um, uh, I think what we should do is the commission should hold a chair election uh, in February uh, when we have hopefully uh, one uh, new commissioners and a uh, full complement of our existing commissioners uh, to nominate, uh, to make comments, uh, and to vote. Um, obviously, I'm one member of the commission, but uh, I think this is a good resolution. Uh, uh, do, is there any objection to proceeding in that manner? Okay, hearing none, uh, we will schedule the election for chair until next month. Uh, in the meantime, Commissioner Kennedy will um, uh, hold things down with uh, Mr. Williams and the staff uh, until uh, we can elect a new chair. Um, uh, we also have a couple of other items on the agenda in terms of updates. Uh, the staff has prepared a report uh, regarding uh, deputies and schools. Uh, they've made a number of recommendations uh, for the commission, uh, which we hope, uh, which I hope the commission will will undertake. One is to identify the various efforts to reimagine school safety uh, and to strengthen the oversight of school law enforcement services. Uh, to uh, agendize this for uh, subsequent. A civilian Oversight Commission meeting uh, and to facilitate a conversation or meeting with all stakeholders, including uh, folks out in the Antelope Valley who have been organizing around this, uh, teachers, students, uh, as well as the Sheriff's Department. Um, one of the other things that we raised uh, during our initial discussion about this was use of force policies in the school setting. 
um, based on what was reported to us by the captain uh, who's responsible for supervising the, the school deputies, um, there is no such specialized policy, uh, which is striking given that children are not adults uh, and we cannot uh, engage with them in a manner uh, that we would uh, adults. Um, obviously, that is not um, uh, addressing the bigger question as to whether sheriff's deputies should be in the school districts at all. But that is not, obviously, that's not the call of this commission. That is the call of the Board of Supervisors, as well as the various districts um, in the Antelope Valley where the Sheriff's Department has contracts. Uh, so we hope that the Board of Supervisors will take uh, a look at this very closely and review whether it's appropriate to renew uh, the, or to sign off on the renewed contract um, if, if the question comes up. Um, so those are the updates with regard to um, our uh, work on uh, sheriff's deputies and schools. There's also a draft attached to the agenda of the 2021 highlights uh, of the work of the Civilian Oversight Commission. Uh, I would ask that members of the commission take a look at that document, which is in draft form. It's also available to members of the public. Uh, this is not its final form. So if there are comments or suggestions that you have for our staff, which uh, has worked very diligently on this report, uh, please submit your comments to uh, Mr. Williams. Um, my understanding is that the staff is going to use this document as the basis to produce a scorecard for the Sheriff's Department in terms of their um, uh, movement on our recommendations uh, that were highlighted in this report. So please do take a look at that um, uh, document. Are there any questions about either the update on the school district or on the um, uh, 2021 work highlights? Okay, uh, seeing none, we will move on to uh, agenda item number four, which is general public uh, comment. Uh, so we will take public comment up until about one o'clock. Uh, so um, uh, I'll uh, ask Jennifer how many people we have signed up for general public comment. We have four individuals with their hand raised. So that's all I have accounted for at this point. If you have not raised your hand and you want to make a comment, please raise your hand now. Do we have additional uh, individuals who'd like to make a public comment? It's looking like just three at this point. Okay, um, so let's take those three comments. Uh, we will uh, give each of those individuals one minute. Okay, and we will get started with Julie Martinez. Julie, you are unmuted. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, um, my comment is, um, first of all, I wasn't able to um, speak to the mother of um, this, uh, lo this, her son, Lovett, who died in custody. But I, my heart goes out to her. I understand how she feels. My grandson was also killed at a routine traffic stop in 2019. And what I, my, my general comment is we really need the civilian oversight to step up and to please represent us in the community who are, who are, who are victims of both sheriff violence, sheriff murders, and harassment. And lastly, I'd like to say that I know that when the COC was first, um, the impetus of the COC was that they would have a, one of the COC members would be a member of the community who had been um, impacted directly by sheriff violence or, or possibly someone who had actually been in sheriff operated jails. And I, my question and comment is, is that still a mandate for the uh, COC to be more inclusive of the community in order, in order to have a commission member who has been directly impacted by sheriff violence? Thank you. Thank you, Julie. And next we will hear from Raquel Derfleur. You're unmuted. Please go ahead with your comment. Hi there. Yes, yeah. so I'm speaking about the update on the, um, police in schools. So thank you for listening to my earlier comments about my meeting with the uh, Lancaster captain about that incident at Lancaster High. Um, basically, we just need your help with um, the settlement agreement because uh, school resource officers are um, covered under that. And at this point, there's no reason for LASD to comply. There is no real consequence. There was no consequence for them other than the settlement agreement um, just continues. And uh, they are currently in court right now trying to 
uh, have it come to an end. So we are just asking, I'm asking for my community um, to please look into this, to do some kind of hearing, to figure out why after, you know, all these years, they're still not in compliance with the basic things that were laid out in that settlement agreement. Thank you. And next, and Ms. Uh, uh, Derfleur, um, please make sure yes. that our staff has your contact information so that we can follow up and include you on any yes. conversations. And for lovely. And I'm completely, I have the settlement agreement in full and I personally met with the captain to um, discuss that incident. So it was an actual, you know, it wasn't hearsay. It was me sitting next to him. So I'll go ahead, I guess, and put it, um, should I put it in the chat? You can put it in the chat. You could also uh, email us um, through our website at coc.lacounty. Uh, dot gov or coc notify at la uh, coc .la county gov is our, our email address. So okay, either one of those is fine. I'll do I'll do both. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And the next comment will come from Valerie Vargas. You're unmuted. Please go ahead, Valerie. Okay, it looks like Valerie may be unavailable. And the last individual that has raised their hand for public comment is Tamara K. Please go ahead with your comment, Tamara. I um, so we need to cancel all the contracts of LASD, LASD out of schools and hospitals. We need to remove Sheriff Villanueva, and also um, as far as public comment, you know, this is a civilian oversight, and us to get like I, I understand you have a lot of uh, presentations and whatnot, but for the community, only get a minute and thirty seconds. After four, being on the call for four hours isn't like proper representation. We need to be allocated a, a decent amount of time for public comment. Um, we absolutely need to take every measure to remove the sheriff and to hold him accountable. He can't keep uh, evading subpoenas. We have to get rid of the LA, LASD gangs. Um, I'm not sure why uh, Commissioner Oshun is leaving. She was just appointed to this position, we really need you. And um, I might have missed the, the beginning of the meeting, but I'm hoping that you'll continue to be the chair of this and that commission. And your you. time. And we do have one individual, an anonymous call-in user. You are unmuted. You'll be the last person for public comment and you have one minute, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, this is Mel Bailey again. I just um, wanted to say, you know, I know we have the sheriff now, and I just ask if more resources can be allocated to assist. In Compton, we have a lot of street takeovers, and part of the problem is they say that they don't have enough people to help. And those takeovers do end up sometimes um, with fatalities, and I just think that we would, you know, really need to encourage that. And um, that, was, that was it. You guys have a blessed day. Thank you. Thank you. And Chair Ochin, that does conclude all of the public comments. All right. Thank you all so much. Um, I want to make a quick announcement before we adjourn. Uh, um, our ad hoc committees are very active, uh, and that is, um, you know, to the credit of our staff and uh, our five remaining commissioners. Um, it's like the Hunger Games out here. Uh, uh, people who are just we're just losing commissioners. So we hope that uh, folks have heard our call for uh, applicants. Um, we absolutely um, encourage people who have been directly impacted to apply. We want to have a diverse commission. Uh, we encourage people uh, from the Latino community, from the Black community. Uh, to uh, from the API community, from the indigenous community to apply to be commissioners. We need your voice on this body um, uh, uh, immediately. So please um, go to our website, um, uh, download an application and submit uh, your application to join this uh, body. Um, uh, I would invite folks who who participate um, and, and attend our meetings uh, to apply. Um, you will shape our agenda. You will shape how much time uh, can be given to the community and how much uh, outreach uh, we can give, the kinds of questions that we ask, what our priorities are. We are you. We are all uh, civilians. Uh, we are all residents of LA County who deeply care about these issues, um, just like you do. And so we hope that you will um, uh, either apply directly or encourage other people to apply, um, especially so that we can be as representative of LA County um, and people who are directly impacted as possible. 
I also want to note uh, that our budget ad hoc committee will be reviewing the uh, Sheriff's Department's uh, 2002, 2022-2023 uh, uh, budget priorities later this month before the Sheriff's Department goes to the uh, um, uh, county CEO for budget recommendations. Members of the public are requested to submit their public comments on our specific uh, or uh, to make public comments at our meetings uh, for the 2022-2023 budget, uh, which will be sent out and posted after today's commission meeting. There will be multiple opportunities for the public uh, to provide comment throughout the budget prioritization cycle when additional resources become available. Obviously, almost every issue we discuss uh, comes down to budget priorities, which are a reflection of our, our general priorities in LA County. And so um, for those of you who, who think the sheriff should get more funding, you should, you should uh, come to our meeting. For those of you who think that those funds should be redirected to mental health services, alternative crisis responders, uh, alternative school uh, resource office, alternative school safety plans, and so on, are encouraged to uh, to participate. Our next meeting will be on Thursday, September twenty uh, Thursday, September uh, Thursday, February seventeenth, twenty twenty two. And for more information, uh, you can visit coc.lacounty.gov. Uh, uh, I'll also note that the commission uh, is participating in this budget process. Many of you have said for the last five years that I've been on this commission that this commission needs to do more. We can't do more with limited resources, right? We need more resources in order for us to be robust, uh, a robust oversight entity. We need more uh, staffing uh, and we need more authority. Uh, so we hope that the public will be engaged uh, to support the commission as we request uh, uh, as we submit requests uh, to uh, the LA County Board of Supervisors for additional staffing um, and for additional support. We're grateful for, to the board for uh, uh, working with us to get pro bono counsel, um, but our needs go much further than that. And so we hope that uh, the public will support us in our calls for more resources for civilian oversight of the Sheriff's Department. Um, and so with that, uh, that will, we're just about one minute over. Uh, this will conclude our meeting for today. And I just want to say again, uh, thank you all so much uh, to all of my colleagues uh, uh, on the staff of the Civilian Oversight Commission and to my colleagues on the commission. It's been an honor to serve on this body and to serve as chair these few months. Uh, I look forward to continuing to work with you all and advocating for a more just, equitable, uh, and fair system of accountability, safety, and justice in LA County. So uh, with that, uh, we'll conclude our meeting. Thank you all.